Hello? Is this thing on? Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That was a great stream. I'm glad we got a lot done. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. I hope you all had a blast. Um, <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I got to come up with content, don't I? So I had this idea that either... While waiting for the stream to come up, I would either make a smoothie or take a shower. And what I did was neither. I just, uh, I clipped my fingernails and I refilled my water and I watched some YouTube videos. <laughs> Woo! That's some responsibility right there. Hard Target 4, thank you so much for the four months of Subarino. Hell yeah. Maybe we'll make a celebratory smoothie later. Sound like Nuda? I don't know who that is. But I am... I don't know if I'm glad that I sound like them. I've got like a... I, I don't know what happened. I must have bit my tongue in my sleep or some shit. But my tongue kind of hurts. So I'm probably going to sound a little weird today. As I avoid tongue contact with my, with my teeth. Being an adult is hard. I know. I've been making these smoothies, and they've been delicious. I mean, I would have made it, but my blender, I would need to clean. So, it's it's currently in the, in the dirty dishwasher. And I didn't want to manually clean it. So, uh, so, that didn't happen. Technically, it's a food processor, not a blender. I probably should get a blender... Because I'm guessing a, a blender is a lot easier to clean than a food processor. Because a food processor is a little bit extra. Time to buy a new... What goes into a gamozo smoothie? Uh, assorted frozen fruits, including banana. Assorted frozen flutes, fr flutes of the flavor of my taste. The banana is a required agent as the binder. It adds the texture... The flavor of banana, I'm not 100% keen on, but the texture is really important in a smoothie. And then two shots of clear liquid. <laughs> and it's fantastic. That's what, I've been, that's what I've been doing. Now, maybe that's because I've been too lazy to get White Claws... Because I haven't gone to the grocery store in like two weeks. So like, you know, you know a little column A, a little column B. <laughs> oh, yeah. Banana milkshakes are so good. What's a banana milkshake? What the, what the fuck is that? How do you make a banana milkshake? That sounds disgusting. Honestly, the only milkshake that is good is vanilla. Maybe like an Oreo, but but that's like more of a malt, right? But like lime milk seeds. What what is a lime milkshake? What do you what do you people drink? <laughs> what what is wrong with y'all? You actually add vanilla to banana milkshake? I'm assuming a banana milkshake is just a vanilla milkshake where you put some banana in there. But at what point does a milkshake become a smoothie? And at what point does a smoothie become a milkshake? You know, th these are really complicated things. Kind of like what's the difference between a soup and a stew and a bisque and a broth? Yeah, like, all of these things are very difficult. Mango plus soy milk. Ugh. Honestly, let's, let's just be honest. The only good product that comes out of a cow is cheese. Beef is okay. Beef is C-tier. 
But like, milk is ass. It's just gross. It's just gross. I'm sorry. It just, I, I just don't want to taste watery fat soup. <laughs> and I grew up in Wisconsin. I've had, I've had it straight from the teat. And it's just, even, like, in, in Wisconsin, milk is acceptable. But outside of Wisconsin, milk is just ass. Every milk that you have outside of Wisconsin tastes like fucking milk that's at least two weeks old. It's just a whole different ball game. <laughs> I can live without milk, but don't take away my cheese. Milk is an okay medium for cereal. And, and the only purpose milk has in cereal is not flavor. It is to pre prevent the cereal from cutting your mouth to shreds, right? It's a, it's a soothing agent. Everyone only likes one brand of milk. Yeah, I'm guessing it's something like whatever you grew up with. Need to taste Norwegian milk? Best in the world? Well, you know what? That sounds pretty comparable to Wisconsin milk. Now, it's not that bagged shit that they have in Canada. What the fuck are you doing up there? When I go to the store, I don't want to have to buy a pitcher to, to place my plastic milk bag into. <laughs> that was actually kind of a... We, we had that a little bit in Wisconsin. That's the East Coast. I don't, I don't remember... I'm... I probably only bought milk like twice on the East Coast. Now, over here in Seattle, we can just get it in glass jars, and it's fantastic. You just bring the jar back for a deposit. <laughs> Bagged milk is an abomination. <laughs> Bagged milk's great. <laughs> we, uh, we had bags on the West Coast like 15 years ago. Huh. We have plastic jugs. Plastic jugs are okay. I, I would say the tier list is, is glass, is above cartons, which is above plastic jugs, which is above bags. How do you pour bagged milk? You, you, cut, a little, you cut a little bit off the side and just kind of YOLO it. It's, it kind of sucks. Uh... <laughs> So the OS dev is on hold? You must be new to here, but we we don't stick to projects for more than a couple hours. We gotta... We gotta keep that content coming, you know? And by content coming, it's just... I, I just get bored of shit. Actually, I'm not bored of the OS dev stuff, but... Honestly, that OS dev project... I don't know if I want to do on stream, because... You know, sometimes... Sometimes, chat behaves like a bunch of fucking userland devs and userland devs always get all excited about features and progress and doing things quickly making uis making colorful flashing blinking lights and sometimes sometimes i spend five days on an alligator. <laughs> Sometimes we just, you know, like like yesterday, you know, we 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 went through like a couple ideas of how we want to serialize this, and 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 of course there are many ways that we can do this, and some are obvious, more obvious than others, but but in the back of my mind, when I'm when I'm developing something like this, I'm not thinking about how do I do it. I'm thinking about, okay, in the average X509, there's probably going to be, I don't know, between 50 and 150 serialized ints, which means I'll need to do this about 150 times in input. And couple that with the fact that I'm running about 30 million fuzz cases a second, I effectively need to be able to do this function a billion times a second. So sometimes there's a little bit of extra thought that goes into things, and, and I think 
that makes kernel dev on stream sometimes relatively difficult because sometimes the thoughts that are going into things are not how do I do it, but how do I have something that supports the feature set that I want to have two months from now? And sometimes, sometimes that can get tough. Everything's always on hold until we get back to it. Yeah, that's pretty fair. When does the physics project start? Uh, when I can justify spending like 20 to 30 grand on making a nice double E lab. Which, I don't know. I just need a, a couple good YOLO trades. And I think, I think we'll be there. We'll, uh, we'll YOLO trade. We'll, we'll run it up a little bit. We'll see, uh, we'll see what we can do. But I want to, I want to get some, I want to get some hardware, some, some electronics kit that I wouldn't regret having two years from now. And I know if I get something cheap two years from now, I'd just regret it because I'd end up buying something more anyways. So... I don't know. Where do you trade? I, I mainly trade futures. I trade currency and equity futures. Um, love learning about allocators and clobber in my own memory with Calic. Sounds pretty, sounds pretty classic. New here, what are we fuzzing? Uh, right now we're uh, kind of fuzzing an X5 and 9 parser. I mean, right now we're doing nothing. We're, we're talking with chat. Um, but we're fuzzing some random X5 and 9 parser. It looks like it's called Asinine. It's a relatively good library. Do you have any code for your trading? Not that I use anymore. Uh, back when I did like more active trading, now I mainly do swing trading, but back when I used to do day trading, which is a stupid way to trade, um, I had some like custom visualization in real time stuff that would like kind of, uh, especially for futures, it would, it would basically point it would plot a uh, bid ask weighted price, which would give me like an infinitely divisible price, and it allowed me to see like the, basically the the perceived value uh, between ticks, which actually was pretty well formed and had some decent like leading indicators if you could react in under like a, a millisecond to make a trade. Um, but I've kind of moved away from that. I, it's interesting, but ultimately you just make so much more money just fucking dumping something and, and letting it sit, you know, letting it ride for a bit. Um, let's see. We can warm up with some math and theory. Yikes, probably not. You got any bounties for these phones? I don't do bug bounties. It's not my cup of tea. Um, I only work for companies that pay me to, to find bugs. I don't, I don't find bugs and then ask companies to pay me. They can, uh, they can have me on payroll or a contract if they want me to spend effort on something. Um, Bad Cafe, thank you so much for the tier one sub. Hell yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Blinking lights is still running. Wow. Really? What is, what is that? Uh... Blinkinlights.nl, something, something dot blinkinlights.nl. You, you tell that in, you get the Star Wars. That's some good stuff. So you're hired out to do this X509 stuff. I'm just doing this to teach chat how to, how to fuzz. Um, let's see. I once found an instant capture bypass for Amazon and was super excited. I went to bed, woke up, and it was fixed. Didn't report it. Oh, uh, they probably fucking got you. They probably got you. They probably had some telemetry and they, they fucked you up. That's the real trick. Is if you're ever fuzzing something or ever trying to find bugs in something, if you can do it offline, do that shit offline. Because those crash reports get scrutinized. Toweled up Lincoln Lights. NL. Yeah, I forget. Why do they call it towel? The IPv6 version has extra scenes and extra color support. Ah, it's too advanced. You gotta get IPv6. Ha! <laughs> ha! Imagine using IPv6. Ha! <laughs> ah, current year. <laughs> the IPv6. <laughs> yeah. Amazon had pre-generated captures too. Kind of dumb if you ask me. Isn't that what everyone has? I don't think there are too many places that have completely automatic... 
gonna have to use my cell phone to see it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hey, brains man, how's it going? How are you doing today? No IPv6 for Canadian ISPs? What? 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 What happened with that? Did did the maple syrup gum up the IPv6 lines? Is is Rogers doing Rogers things? <laughs> Guess and towel is a Hitchhiker's Guide reference as it mentioned so long and thanks for all the fish as well. Oh, huh. Interesting. Yeah, I I I can't get references because I am uneducated with the J. I I haven't read too much uh too much stuff in reality, unfortunately. All right. I wish I knew. I assume they consider it's too much work. It's probably fair. I mean, do you have the do you have the stuff in Canada that we have in the U.S. where we'll get the government to pay a couple billion dollars for some infrastructure to be built that doesn't get built? <laughs> you should read Penrose's Road to Reality if you're interested in physics. You'll not be the same person afterwards. But I like who I am. I don't want to change. As a programmer, I've always been interested in depth. <laughs> And uh, I've always been interested in desktop application vulnerability hunting. But imagine it's a crazy amount of work to get started. It, 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 it yeah. I mean, I, I'm supposed to say it isn't such that I'm not gatekeeping. But in reality, it's a lot of fucking work. You need to understand internals pretty well if you want to be effective at it. Um, but you can you can throw AFL at some shitty applications and, and get bugs to rain out. Ultimately, bugs get harder as the surface gets more sensitive. So, like, finding a bug in a browser is going to take an experienced person a couple months, which means it will take a new, basically, eternity. Like, once every two years, maybe they'd stumble into something. Um... But if it comes to, like, some random third-party corporate bullshit application that no one uses, enterpriseenterprise.com, um, it's probably a joke and AFL would knock it over. Now, actually doing something with that vulnerability, well, once again, requires a significant amount of uh, work and knowledge. Um, it's a pretty uncommon skill set for people to have. What about that Tian Fu cup? Is this just a, a CTF? It's got a lot of redirects. Um, pwn contest. Oh, it's a it's a it's a new pwn to own. Kind of interesting. I don't know. I I don't really care too much about the pwn to owns and those sorts of things. Uh, the the stuff they do is pretty cool. Uh, I would say the people who actually contribute to those are. Uh, pretty skilled. The exploits are typically awful, and I don't know. I feel like landing a bug is more interesting if you actually, like, thoroughly pwn the target rather than just, like, do your, you know, takes five minutes to land sort of thing. Totally did not read that as fuck up. Prices are nice. I'm not too worried about it. I don't, I don't need many more ways to monetize my work. I'm happy with where I, where I am. I'll just coast. I'll coast and uh, do Twitch streams and take my paycheck, not really worry about work. <laughs> Find it interesting because it's an uncommon skill set. Yeah, it's kind of a... Uh... Ah. It's... I don't know, like, I, I'm trying to think if I'm going to, if I if I disagree with what I'm about to say, but it's kind of a dying art. Um, most security research is moving towards, like, companies, and companies are more towards, uh, design review. Like, finding and landing bugs is reserved pretty much only to governments and, like, a couple firms, like, Project Zero, that kind of do offensive things. But most offensive groups at companies these days are just moving more and more towards design review um, and mitigations, which are the correct ways to solve these problems, right? Finding bugs is 
basically worthless. Um, explaining bugs is still valuable offensively so that you can find mitigations uh, or like good strategies to mitigate your exploit techniques. But ultimately, the exploit techniques that you often come up with at, in an offensive, like at an offensive defensive perspective, are typically mm, basically they're they're copies of the exploits you see at Pwn to Own, and Pwn to Own exploits are not high end exploits. They're they're kind of bottom of the barrel proof of concepts, right? You're given like five or 15 minutes or some ridiculous amount of time to land the bug. Um, and in reality, the, the, the methodology and the way that you actually go about exploiting things when you want something that's 5% reliable that you throw 20 times or 50 times is a lot different than something that you're going to throw against the head of some government's phone and literally if they crash you like might start a war or serious sanctions so like the amount of energy that goes into making a resilience uh exploit that can survive various different versions of an application and doesn't rely as much on fixed offsets and can dynamically fingerprint things and will kind of future-proof bypass some mitigations. Like, when you hear rumblings of a mitigation, you, like, kind of avoid that. Like, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Um, I don't know. Offensive is tricky, especially if companies want... Uh, Want to know who wants to pwn them, Chinese or Russian? At the uh, and in the end, it's just guessing surrounded uh, in guessing surrounded in BS lingo sounding wording. Yeah, that yeah, more like Voln intelligence than offensive. Yeah, I I can't really speak to the Voln intelligence stuff. It, it seems interesting. Um, one thing that I don't get about the Voln intelligence people: why the fuck do they always build command centers? Like why? Every fucking time you see, like, some random company hiring, they're like, we've got a leap command center with 50 flat screens and station. Like, the f <laughs> Like, literally, it's entirely someone saw fucking, like, hackers, or they saw, um, uh, uh, is it hackers? What's the, what's the one with the Gibson? Is that hackers with the Whopper, uh, the, 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 like, like all of the, fu you get in the room, yeah, James Bond, pretty much the same sort of shit. Fuck, what is that movie? Is it, is that Hackers? No, Hackers is, uh, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> okay, there, Mr. Circle Desk. See, that's for peak efficient, War Games, that's the one. War Games. I'm fucking disappointed in chat that I can say the Whopper... I don't think I said global thermonuclear war, but the fact that I said Whopper and that and that didn't land right away, yikes, chat. What are y'all even up to? <laughs> I don't know. I, the security industry is starting to get more and more frustrating to me as an offensive researcher. Like, fuzzing, right? Fuzzing in the past year has very radically shifted to corporate, wide-scale, shallow-depth, fully automated, CI-pipelined sort of bullshit. And it's starting to wear on me a bit. Like... I think that's kind of why I critique some of the fuzzers and I'm harsh of a lot of these things. But I think in reality, it's just... I feel like the art that I've studied is just kind of dying. Or not that it's dying, that it's being replaced with something that is just... banging your head on a keyboard. When it's actually a much more methodical, designed, thought-processed-out tool and process that that very tightly integrates with static analysis and just reading code um it's starting to frustrate me sadly hackers also had a command center scene although it's uh 
Like, uh, uh, two to three people get surrounded by screens and servers. Any comments regarding Microsoft's Project One Fuzz? Eh. Like, I know the people who worked on it, and I appreciate the work, but it's, it's not the sort of shit that interests me, right? So I don't want to say that's a negative about One Fuzz, because One Fuzz looks fucking amazing. But ultimately, it's not something I'm interested in. There's a reason I wasn't involved in it. It's just not... I don't know. I, I like to make tools that are an extension of a human. I'm not a huge fan of the pure automation. And I I've had that mindset for a while. Um, what about Lane? Is that the Rust thing? That's the... Yeah, this is like the, the Rust crate. This is actually really cool. Um... We're probably going to write something similar to this. We're not going to do like this whole crate. But here, here's the problem. When, when you make libraries and you make generic implementations of things, you start to very quickly lose performance and control. Um, I like just rolling my own shit because the targets I typically invest in uh, allow me to do that. I, I don't have... I don't have deadlines that are strict enough that I have to just immediately get something shit out. I, I'd rather just... I don't know. I, I like writing shit from scratch. I got no problem doing that. I love it. What's next for you after fuzzing? I don't know. Like, maybe... Maybe... Physics. Probably hard science. I don't know. It... it it does bother me that I'll spend... Like, vectorized emulation is a pretty impressive feat of engineering. And it doesn't fucking matter, right? Like, if people just wrote their code in Rust, Vecimu is pointless, right? So, like, five years from now, when most of the things that are really critical are either heavily sandboxed or partially written in a safe language for the pre-auth components... Like, basically everything I've done for the past 10 years is kind of worthless. Now, obviously, it, it like, some of the things that I've done will build into fuzzing CI pipeline bullshit to catch low-hanging fruit. But, but, like, my job has no reason to exist. My job sheerly exists off of people's laziness. And, and obviously saving money but like we have safe languages we have c sharp we have rust we have go we have python we have all these fucking languages that you could write your shit in and it would make all of the effort that i have in a lot of the security research kind of pointless right and like i can come up with crazy tools and crazy techniques and all of these things but ultimately, when the world gets their shit together, and they have no option, they do have to get their shit together at some point, most of this knowledge and tooling and efforts and research doesn't matter. Like, obviously, it's helped me become smarter and learn how to program, and, like, given I've done shit to Intel processors, like, I'm pretty sure the... The way that I pursue things is more of a scientific approach, and that's what I've learned out of all of this. But a lot of the specifics that I've done are not the most applicable to the, to the world when we make improvements. Um, and I've, I've kind of gone on this rant before, and people have disagreed with me, but it's still kind of the stance I hold that, like, if you do research in, in, in physics or hard sciences and you make a discovery... Um, or more specifically, if you make a measurement, as long as the measurement wasn't flawed, uh, which is sometimes difficult, um, it's just a thing now. And in computer security, that's not the case. Like, okay, I spend, I spend a year full chaining a an iPhone, right? Find a browser bug, find a sandbox escape, find a kernel bug, find a persistence bug on the device, right? Maybe a bootloader bug. Like, basically chain all that shit together. You spend, like, probably a year or two to, to do a full chain would be a reasonable amount of time to spend. Um, 
And then it just gets, like, you either report it and it just gets patched, or you don't report it and the bug gets patched naturally when someone else finds it or they refactor the code. And it's like, you spend years building up extremely specialized knowledge and extremely valuable, uh, like, tools and knowledge and skills, and then it really only matters as long as the bug exists, right? And that kind of sucks, right? Like, it, it, it wears on you. Um, th those sorts of things just slowly add up, and, and eventually you just kind of get burnt out from that sort of process. Um, I'm not in interested in defensive stuff. I like doing mitigations. I'd love to do sandboxing and hypervisor dev, and I've got a bunch of ideas for for making like pretty general purpose high performance sandboxing techniques that don't require compiler mitigations and stuff. Um, and those are fun, but those are more like pure development. And I think in reality, I like research. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, and I feel like more and more my job is no longer, well, my job is to do research, right? My, my current job. But the security industry is moving more and more to this being a, a requirement slash task slash basically security engineers are just going to become glorified testers. Like, I really think that's where we're headed. I, I know people are going to give me shit and they're going to say, no, that's not what's happening. But I'm sorry, like, every company is making general purpose, shallow, low performance, cloud scaling fuzzers that are designed that the developer does the entire thing by pointing it to a function and doesn't help the fuzzer along beyond that point. And I, I seriously think we're just going to move to this world where these defensive companies are just going to have developers write these tests and, and security researchers for some of the fringe shit. But ultimately, the bugs are going to end up lasting so fucking long because people are just going to run AFL on your... You're going to point something with a buffer and a length. You're going to run AFL on that. And if you don't find bugs then you know you don't have bugs in it, and congratulations, you're good. When in reality, there's a lot of effort that goes into making a good corpus and making sure that you create valid inputs, and there's a lot of things that a generic mutator can't fuzz. Things with checksums, f things with, like, nested length structures where changing one length it requires that you change another length, and you just, you build up so many different things um, that it can kind of just become a little messy. But, I don't know. So is you streaming and, uh, is you streaming and learning uh, uh, and teaching people about your knowledge of fuzzers, kind of you transitioning away from fuzzer research, moving on to something new? Probably. Like, I don't know, right? I, I'm just kind of winging it. But it, like, all of this feels natural, right? Starting my, starting my Twitter like a year or two ago, starting doing blogs, doing these Twitch streams, like all of it seems natural. And it's probably just more simple as me just chasing something that I enjoy. But ultimately, it's just like, usually there's a reason for it, and I just don't really understand it. Uh, typically, it's like, I know that's just the direction that I'm going. Um, I don't know. Hard to say. But I, I feel like I belong in offensive security research and uh it just feels like the industry is moving more and more away from the from the sort of work that I do and that's understandable the work that I do is is very labor intensive um and unfortunately I just I don't know I I think I think the automation is going to basically prevent some of the most basic and shallow bugs but it's going to make some of the longer, some of the deeper bugs just last even longer because no one's going to find them. You know, managers are going to be like, we don't need to audit this thing because we have uh, we have 50 cores on the cloud fuzzing this in, in, as part of our CI pipeline on every push or pull request to master. 
Like, why, why would we need security researchers? Like, seriously, I just, I'm starting to see the writing on the wall for offensive security research in the way that I kind of bring it to the table. Um, what you're describing for fuzzing is already what happened with web stuff and people uh, running burp and whatever. Yeah. Basically the story of automation in every field. Yeah. Sure, that means the good bug hunters will just resort to exploit br brokers. Yeah, pretty much. I think that's like always a, 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 a much more fun industry, to be honest. Um, it, it then comes down to morals, right? That's kind of where it's difficult is it's, it's a lot less pay and morals can be a little bit more questionable. Obviously, if you can find a group that you supply exploits to that you align yourself with morally, whether you change your morals or your morals already did align with them, then like that's you, you fucking do you, right? Like, I'm not going to fault someone for their relative view of morals. Um, even though it, most people's views of morals differ from my view of morals, like, unfortunately, people are willing to fight for their country wherever the fuck they are, right? And that's not going to change. I think, it's, I think it's a little bit fucked up to just assume that everyone has the exact same morals you have. Because, um, unfortunately, that's just, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think you can do offensive security research in a responsible way. Um, if you don't fucking, don't sell to like a fucking public exploit broker, right? Find, get yourself a connection slowly but surely. Meet people at conferences. Figure out who's actually getting the bugs. Figure out what their goals are with those bugs. And, and... Try and, uh, try and find a, a group that, that you'd like to support if you want to go down the offensive way. But in the... Don't fucking go to one of these brokers that's going to sell it to literally every country. Literally every fucking country, regardless of how they treat their citizens. Right? Like, it, it's just... Basically, the higher price you can get for an exploit, typically the shadier the uh, the buyer, right? You end up you end up selling to like the top five countries that you would never visit in real life because you're fucking terrified of them. But that's that's who's buying the exploits, and they're using them to like kill and prison imprison their own citizens, right? So I think it's important to to understand kind of the the path that your exploit would go down. Um, I've seen this, uh, I've seen recently an ad from this UAE company called, uh, Dark Matter or something. Knowledge of AFL and Hongfa is required. Yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable for, like, an offensive firm. Actually, needing, like, AFL and Hongfa sounds more like, uh, police and military. Um... I don't know. Let's see. Um, what else? Uh, let's see. What's this in response to? Uh, we had an argument with my colleague. He said it's not, uh, secure and we should use additional encryption, but I have no idea how to decrypt anything in a browser securely. Um, I generally say that's BS. For most applications, you won't need additional encryption. The exception would be if you want to keep the HTTPS server in the dark if the data is going somewhere else. Then you'd encrypt it with another key so that only authorized parties can read it. Um, if that doesn't match your use case, uh, then just make sure your HTTPS server is well configured. And if you get an A or an A plus, you're golden. Yeah, that's pretty, sounds pretty good. AFL jobs? They literally call it AFL jobs. <laughs> oh, I see. This is like a job searching website. Ah. Huh. Lead security researcher. Oh, cool. What annoys you more, academia or industry? I mean, academia for sure, right? 
Like, it's, I don't know. Both academia, like, academia is pretty much entirely looking at general purpose fuzzing and automation and going wide. Uh, there's not too much in academia about going deep. Um, so I'm not, like, 100% interested in that path. Uh, just like in general, academia work is typically not aligned with the research that I'm interested in doing. And industry work, there's like, arguably there's the offensive industry and the defensive industry. And the offensive industry, uh, I think, aligns a lot more with the, the style of work that I enjoy. Hey, Nipsey, how's it going? My uni is usually focused on ML and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Academia is busy doing novel things. That's fair. They got me on that. Um. <laughs> ML and fuzzing. ML and fuzzing is actually really applicable, and arguably fuzzing is a form of ML. Um... I, I don't know. M ML is often just... It's not... We have no great techniques for ML of exploring new things. We mainly have things that are, that are good at repeating historical things, right? Repeating and augmenting historical activities that they've observed. Um... And there's really no reason to repeat historical things when you're looking for deep bugs in a target. Um, I think some of the good examples are some of like the speedrunning um, hacks and stuff, or, or like uh, 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 like major glitches in games that allow you to like skip the whole game or reprogram it or get code execution. Um, None of those bugs would ever even remotely be found with a fuzzer static analysis, literally any automated analysis tool. It, it, they require a large amount of human intervention. Like, like the Grand Theft Auto, like, San Andreas uh, skips, where you need to have, like, ten different preconditions and you need to play through, like, five minutes of gameplay. We have absolutely nothing that would even remotely find a bug like that. Because it's, it's literally, it's the act of finding a, a, a weird bug and then using that bug to break other aspects of the game. And then using that bug to break other aspects of the game. And you keep building these things on top of each other. Um, and ultimately, like, fuzzing and automated stuff is, is only going to find, like, the, the initial pass like the first order bug it's not really going to find the second order bugs that are like bugs causing other bugs to cause bugs to cause bugs especially in a gameplay environment where you don't have a great way to emulate you don't have a great way to quickly analyze things things are running on a heart a large amount of shared code like the script interpreter for whatever the in-game script is like it's kind of like uh Try, try to use AFL with coverage to fuzz um, something running in QMU, where you're gathering coverage on QMU itself, but not the thing that it's running on. And congratulations, it's really hard to get information out of that. And that's kind of what games look like, right? You have, you have loops basically every frame that it's like executing things from a script engine, so basically the same code is always executing there. Um, state machines are massive. There's no security or guarantee between these state machines. They're kind of, the state machines are implied by the way they are used, not actually like strongly, you know, required or strongly mandated that you operate on them in certain ways. Um, and ultimately there's just, it would be nearly impossible to find bugs like that in an automated fashion. Um, any fuzzer that uses the genetic algorithm is ML-based? Yeah. Uh, or fish intervention, like the fish found a bug in Pokemon on stream. What was that? I didn't see the, that. 
Um, are you bullish on crypto? On cryptocurrencies? No. I think cryptocurrencies are, uh, mm, I think they're pretty much all destined for pretty catastrophic failure. I think, I think the second a, like, serious conflict in the world arises, I think crypto will basically go to zero instantaneously. I think short term you can make a lot of money off of people who are putting money into the gambling machine. But ultimately I think crypto is just doomed in a, in a conflict. Um, in, in a worldwide conflict, not a regional conflict. Um, that's the fish cliff. What about gold? I think gold is a really stupid investment. I think gold is, is basically the, the meme investment when people have no idea how to save money. And they're like, oh, I'll buy, I'll buy fucking gold. Gold will be gold will be a good safe investment because it's tangible. No one gives a fuck about a tangible asset, like, in, in the apocalypse situation, no one's gonna be handing out gold because there's not gonna be any value for gold. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I think gold is much less valuable than uh, people give it credit for. What bug does it end up finding? <laughs> oh, this is cool. So they have like a fish playing the game. That's so cool. Du a dupe on a rock bug. Oh, cool. Huh. What Pokemon is that? I don't immediately recognize it. I don't know. I think we've gone through a, a, a good amount of rants here. I think, I think I'm happy with that. We can probably start with the meat of the stream now. Now that 100 people are here, which is crazy. 100 fucking people showing up for the, for the intro when we're just ranting. Let's buy silver to produce silver bullets at least. Fiat sucks. I mean, Fiat, like... I don't know, like, it, it's ultimately the currency that everyone, it's, it, fiat is just correct, it just is, it's just human made up value, which is the same shit for gold, and the sh same shit for crypto, it's all the same shit, like, it's just all the same shit. Um, if you're rich, it's great. That, it's great if you're in the U.S. and you get the the USD. <laughs> I think it's Pokemon Ruby. Oh shit! I haven't played a Pokemon since mm, Pearl. I think was the last one I played. Whatever that would have been. That would have been like 2009, 2010. Of course, I played Pokemon Go. I actually had a lot of fun playing Pokemon Go. I'd go down to, like, the local, uh, the, like, nearby city center and walk around. And I, like, made a bunch of friends just fucking walking around being a nerd. It was actually kind of cool. Like, I would walk, like, 10 miles a day, 10, 12 miles a day. It was, like, really fucking cool. All right. Pro is Gen 4. Yeah, what did I play? I had... I think I had red. Um, Then I had silver. And then I got pearl. So I skipped gen 3. Little text in the clip. Uh... Mentions Team Aqua, which I think means it's Sapphire Emerald. Oh, interesting. What was Gen Three? Wh which ones were those? Was what? What? What was Leaf Green? What was Leaf Green? Leaf Green was three. Okay, 
That was uh, GBA, if I'm not mistaken, right? Fire Red, Fire Red, Emerald, Ruby, and Sapphire. Huh. All right, let's see if we got more coverage. I don't know if we did. Um, I just had this running, I guess, while the stream was starting. Okay. GBA. All right, so uh, today we're going to kind of just go through and try to make our fuzzer a little bit more advanced. So yesterday we ran into issues where we wouldn't basically encode uh, these X509 certificates correctly. Obviously, we're just kind of randomly flipping bytes and randomly uh, inserting magic strings into them. Um, and uh, basically, we need to make something that makes a little bit more well-formed inputs. Um, and I think that we can do this in a, a relatively reasonable way. And I might show uh, kind of two different implementations, or maybe three different implementations of um, different parsers that you can write that handle TLV values. Um, there's kind of lossy implementations uh, that allow you to parse things without actually fully supporting the file format and still mutate them in very, very effective manners. Um, then we can look at making a TLV only parser that will parse the TLVs and splice things together. And then we can look at having something that's actually format aware that will uh, parse subfields and like understand context and stuff. Um, so yesterday we kind of ran a couple different fuzzers on uh, this library that's uh, libas9 or something. It's literally just a random C based. Uh, X509 uh, slash dir decoder uh, that we found on GitHub. It's got a couple stars. It doesn't look like it's used in major projects, so that's what we picked on. Code quality is actually really good for it, and I don't think we have any bugs in it. We have one, like, theoretical bug, but I've never seen it even overnight, so I think there's a chance that we're not understanding 100% some of the constraints of the APIs that they have. So here's a couple of graphs showing basically the fuzzer performance over time if we're looking on the left side or the fuzzer performance um, with fuzz cases on the right side. And the left side actually is more granular information. The, the right side, I need to fix this. Uh, I only sync the fuzz cases every like, like 20 times a second. So you see the first data point like really far back in here. So we're going to go and polish that up. That's going to be the first thing we're going to do. Um, but we got a couple lines here, and uh, kind of from worst to best, we have this line, which is no corpus and no dictionary. So this is basically, I point the fuzzer at the target, and I literally have it flip bytes, and it does code coverage to feed things back. Obviously, it doesn't get very far. It doesn't find too much. There's too many magic strings and too many well-formed things that will never generate. Then we have the no corpus with an OID dictionary. This is something that has no input corpus, so I don't feed it an actual valid input, uh, an X509 that we build upon. It starts from scratch, but it knows a little bit about these OIDs, which are kind of some magic numbers. Then this uh, blue line is the uh, single input corpus with no dictionary, and this is something where uh, basically we've given it a single valid X509 certificate, uh, and we did not give it the OID dictionary. And then we have this light blue line up at the very top, obviously reaching the most amount of coverage, which has the single input corpus as well as an OID dictionary, so it's able to build a little bit upon uh, what we have. Um, now, we can see that, obviously, this one gets the most coverage, and it gets the most coverage in, in two seconds, right? At, at two seconds, and actually, this is technically three seconds, three and a half seconds in, it exceeds the coverage that all the other ones get, even though some of these ran for 10,000 seconds, like three hours or beyond. Um, ultimately, um, making your fuzzer better and giving it more inputs is almost always much more valuable than anything you can do with flipping bytes or mutation strategies or any of that shit. Like, just literally having a good corpus is one of the first steps you should have. And I think that's one of the issues that makes it very difficult to benchmark fuzzers. Because you could have a fuzzer that performs really well in creating new inputs out of thin air, but another fuzzer might perform much better when given a proper, large adequately sized corpus, where it's better at splicing and mutating things together, whereas maybe another fuzzer is better at creating things out of thin air. Ultimately, the thing that splices something together is probably always going to 
outperform something, um, even if you give both of them good corpuses, because the more tuned you make a fuzzer towards creating new things out of thin air, um, the less it's going to rely and trust and build upon your input corpus. And you might be saying, well, you can, you can use an input corpus with something that does, uh, like, basically, like, constructional mutations where you feed back and do compare stuff. And I agree with you there. But ultimately, if you have a well-formed corpus and a tool that acknowledges that the corpus is well-formed and tries to mutate those well-formed things into other slightly well-formed things, you will have more CPU time dedicated towards doing that task than a fuzzer that's more geared towards creating things out of thin air with a shitty corpus, uh, because that's obviously going to be more biased towards trying to find new things out of thin air, which means the strategies they use for mutation are going to more favor compare feedback, they're going to more favor dictionaries, they're going to more favor splicing of known values from those dictionaries, and, and so on and so forth. Whereas if you actually have a good corpus, um, a lot of those strategies end up just making more malformed inputs, right? The ability for something to create a, a well-formed input out of thin air is very low. So if you have a fuzzer that's biased towards making new things or trying to make new things, it will likely detract from a fuzzer that has a good setup um, or, or a good corpus. Um, and that's something that I'm pretty critical about uh, fuzz benchmarking for, but obviously fuzz benchmarking, they don't really care about making a good corpus, it's just about jamming shit in. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this uh, graph on the right to actually indicate the fuzz case identifier uh, for a fuzz case. Um, I'm really scared about doing this because I don't have a great way to know what fuzz case I'm on, mainly because I need to be able to sync that information between threads. And syncing that information between threads is a fucking hard problem. Um, so, I don't know how I want to go about this. Um, basically counting these things all, all together. Uh, hmm. So, this is currently where that stat is from. Oh, it, this literally is every two seconds it just grabs fuzz cases. So we'll have uh, a fuzz case. We're going to pass the fuzz case as part of the coverage database. So the coverage DB, we're going to have to add another field to, which is going to be um, the... Uh, and then we'll have the fuzz case ID. This should be made into a structure by this point. And then 828, this needs to hold... Um, this needs to hold the current fuzz case. And I don't have that number. Um, unfortunately, I merge in the, the fuzz cases on an interval. Basically, um, so I call run, and here's the loop. So basically, for 100 million cycles, which is approximately 1 30th of a second, so about 30 times a second, I merge the statistics into the global statistics database. Um, but I don't have a great way of actually basically storing this statistic. Like, I don't have a great way of having the number of fuzz cases. And this is actually a hard problem that I don't know how I want to solve. Um... So we'll think about that a little bit. Making a good corpus is non-trivial? Oh yeah, it's super difficult. Um, C-base written by some Linux contributor and Cloudflare staff. So code quality is good. Yeah, the code quality is great on this code. Um, making an X509 generator today? Probably not. I, I don't like generators too much. We're probably not going to do a generator. We're going to make a, a deserializer and serializer. That will allow us to basically transform valid inputs. Um, depending on how difficult that is. I'm not sure yet. So we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll figure that one out. Um, I remember in Emerald, there's a hidden island where uh, basically every day there's one in a 65535 chance that it appears and you can go there. It was really unfair because you basically had to uh, had to cheat to get there. Huh.
I don't think there's any known code exec in Gen 3 onwards. I doubt it lacks the bugs that are just not discovered. Yeah, for sure. That would be kind of cool. Okay, so... How do I want to get the current fuzz case on a core? I, I can know my local number of fuzz cases. That's easy, right? This VM statistics fuzz cases has the core local fuzz cases. Um, ha. So one thing that I could potentially do, which is kind of interesting is I could read the global fuzz case number and then add the current cores fuzz cases multiplied by the number of cores and basically assume that there's enough averaging there that the other cores are probably doing an equal amount of work and I can add those things in, but it's still not perfect, which is tough. Hmm. So I actually don't know. I, I'm... Um... So what I could do is I could have an array of fuzz case, uh, number of fuzz cases, and that array would be on different cache lines. And on the rare occasion where I hit new coverage, I would load all of those cache lines and add them together. Which is a very interesting way of doing statistics. Um, it means the case ID is never going to be perfectly accurate, of course. Um, but it's still, like, relatively good. Hmm. So... Um, hmm, so those statistics get merged in, so what I, I'm trying to think how I want to do that, I, I could literally, I could have all the cores record their number of cases executed, on separate cache lines, and then when I get coverage, I sum them all up. Does that sound ridiculous? Do I have a core ID? I have a thread ID, which will be sequential. Um, okay. Let's try this. Const max threads. Um, maximum number of threads allowed for fuzzing. Okay. Unless I just want to do an atomic and it's fine. But I feel like I'm gonna... As long as I measure the atomic... We'll throw it in with... Um... Hmm... Okay, we'll try a global uh, fuzz cases. And we're just gonna try it. Uh, we have this and we'll have fuzz cases. This is 
number of fuzz cases performed. Um, number of fuzz cases started. Uh, basically incremented prior to the uh, cases starting. Right. Okay, and then we will do Atomic Q64. We're going to try this out. 1145. Fuzz cases. Atomic U64. I, I think just due to the memory accesses, the contention might not be too bad on this. Uh, we're going to measure the performance of this. We'll put it in reset cycles. If we see the number exceeding something, then we know that we're losing too much performance uh, tracking it. Our session... Ooh, um, we'll just do case ID. Bam. Okay. This is uh, aisle session fuzz cases dot load ordering sequentially consistent. Actually, relaxed is fine here. It's just a stat. Fourteen ninety one. Uh, okay. Uh, let fuzz cases is equal to this. We're just gonna read the number of fuzz cases, and then here we will uh, compute the number of fuzz cases per second. Super Mario World isn't too bad to pull off either. Yeah, that glitch doesn't look too crazy. Oh, I love how I have it right after. Okay. Uh, sixteen eighty four. This is now going to be on. Uh, we'll put this in reset cycles. Uh, you get a unique uh, fuzz case ID, and this will be pre-indexed. So we'll do uh, IL session fuzz cases fetch add eight ordering relaxed. So and this will be uh, let case ID is equal to this. So, then we're going to pass that into here. Beautiful. Okay, that one we don't need to sync in, of course. Um, and then we just have 829, and I think we are actually in run. We are. So, we'll have case ID U64. And that should be everything plumbed through now. Um, so now we should have super accurate case IDs for coverage. Um, obviously, it's the, f the first one to find coverage is the one who reports it. But if we look at the coverage data here. Oh. So there you can see uh, races occurring. Um, and that's because the, the case ID can vary. So, like, basically this core fell behind, this core got ahead. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Lord, Lord Azalil, Az, Azal, Az, Azazel, going to grab breakfast, beer back, take care, see you in a bit. Um, so is there anything I can do about this? I don't like that data. Oh yeah, and we're gonna make these one indexed as well. Uh, we're just gonna add eight to it. That means we won't we won't start with uh, zero. The only reason we do that is it's just better for log scale. It's just better for log scale, because <laughs> um, obviously log scale has issues. Um, if you start at zero, so that'll just move it so we can start at one. And now we see all of this noise. Um. 
And ultimately, that just needs to be sorted is the problem. Unless I don't do line step. Um... Oh, uh, that's going to look like shit as well. God damn it, that's a really tough problem. Um... So, um, I forget how that coverage is recorded. I think it's based on the line number. Um, okay, we'll just, uh, So how is something like this gonna look? I think all I have to do is sort them by fuzz cases. And I think that'll be fine. Um, Cause right now it's sorted by time. And basically like some cores can be like, this is obviously a fuzz case that took a long time here, which makes sense because it's a deeper fuzz case. Um, obviously, it starts to look better as things go on, but I think if I just sort them... I think if I just sort them, it's fine. Um, yeah, it, it totally is. Oops. Luckily, we parsed this stuff. So, best coverage records that. And then data, we write output. And output is... Looks like this. Hmm. And that's len coverage. And that's plus one. Okay, so basically. I just have to output another one, I guess. How do I want to do that? Can I just output two files? We can do uh, like coverage, um, output time, and output cases. Do you make any changes to Lighthouse or is it the same as the one on GitHub? I made some pretty major changes to add support for uh, RGB formats. Um, and this will be, uh, we'll just be, uh, this will just be a, um, an array. And so will this. And then we'll do, um, output time dot append. Append the uptime. And then uh, output cases. We just append the uh, fuzz cases. And then we just sort both of those. Um, output time. Can I sort in place like that? I think so. Something like that. Obviously that's not gonna be right. Output is not defined here. This is gonna be data. Uh, 
Oh, I guess I can just merge those two. So I can do output is equal to blah, and then for I I time cases in uh, output time dot oop, zip output time output cases enumerate that something like that output plus equals uh, ten dots uh, we'll do like for sixteen dot six th that's the time. Cases That should be enough digits. Yeah, it is and then This will be the coverage ID I guess Let's see how that looks Uh, so we have the time. Oh, I need to do F on that. Float. Okay. And then what do we have? What was our previous format? I guess our previous format, uh, Cases uptime coverage. So we'll just uh, we'll do the same thing. Okay, there we go. Uh, set. Uh, replace W points with W step G. There we go. Oh, that's so good. Look at that data. We literally can see it from the first cases all the way to the end. That is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful improvement. Um... Obviously, in the time domain, it's just like a vertical line because we're doing how many fuzz cases per second? Um, five point four million a second. Yeah. So, so basically, like. The first five million, so like this area happens in the first second, right? So like, beautiful. That data looks great. Okay, so we're gonna remove star.txt um, because we switched to this new format. So now we should have basically infinite resolution on everything. Um, yeah, there we get some coverage happening, and then we get the big spike. Obviously, in the time domain, uh, there's a cost to jitting it. Uh, in this case, I think this is accurate. We basically record the case ID of when we got coverage, and then we just sort those. Um... And some should be repeated. Like, we'll see, yeah, we'll see multiple 56s, which means if we look at data.txt, we'll see, yeah, we see repetition. Um, beautiful. Obviously, there's a time cost, uh, and that's why I like looking at these two graphs. There's typically a lot more definition in the fuzz cases, because this, this doesn't factor in the cost of jitting, and basically... We don't even execute our first fuzz case for like a second, right? Because we're waiting for threads to spin up. Threads are forking the, the original VM. Like, there's a lot of stuff happening where this kind of actually shows the true performance when it's not factoring in uh, random latencies and costs to spinning things up. So that looks really good. 
That looks really good. Um, and then that'll just update as we pull it down if we're running it, and we are. So we should be up to, what's that, 900 million cases? Yeah, so we're almost at a billion cases. So once we get to a billion, we should be able to refresh it, and we'll have a 1 times 10 to the ninth will be the last thing on the x-axis. And, well, I guess... Um, this graph actually doesn't update unless there's new coverage found. Um, and I think I might want to change that. I think what I might do, um... I might just overwrite, well, hmm, I kind of just want to want to add another point, which is like currently where the fuzzer is, because obviously it's been running longer than that. Well, we just got some new coverage, but this basically won't print this won't graph a flat line at the end it will only update as new coverage comes in um and then i would have to kind of change the format if i wanted to allow that um i'd also either keep appending things to coverage or i'd want to recreate the file every time uh, i think this file is going to be small enough that we can just do this um So what we'll do is for coverage in zero to CDBL, and then this will be the coverage ID uh, coverage. Um, okay, we're gonna put this in some curly boys, scope that in a bit. We're basically not differentially updating this file. This might cause a ah uh, if let some f uh, if let okay mute file is equal to this. That way it's failable. So uh, dump uh, coverage information. So every time we print, we will dump uh, to the coverage file. And now we have a coverage ID that we'll add to the front of that file that which we're typically we're not currently using. Um, or maybe I'll just put like a, a letter out front that will signify that it's like a coverage record. Like this will say that it's like a coverage record, and then this will be uh we can do like this. Yeah, we'll do this. Coming up with these like formats can sometimes be tough. This is gonna be status. Uh, get the number of fuzz cases. Uh, get the number of coverage entries. Okay, so get the number of fuzz cases. Um, I have elapsed, so this will be uh, uh, get the current uptime stats we can do here, I think. Fuzz cases and elapsed. Oh, this is a great file format now. Okay. So we have a status line that's just going to basically give us a, a final data point that we can plot. Um... Okay. Now this is going to fail. Coverage.text. 
Yeah, so now you have C and then S at the end. So this is basically the current status and the current uptime. Um, and then we just need to write a parser for this. Unfortunately, it kind of sucks, but... Um, find all C... Okay. Uh, if ii is equal to len output time minus one, uh, print woo. So that's where we'll grab the status. Okay, so we should have a woo there. I know, I know there's much better ways to do this, but we're just kind of hacking it. So this is going to be uh, last status. It's going to look for an S, 0 to 9 dot. And then we'll just do a um, cov file is equal to this in cov file. Then uh, last status dot find all of file negative one so we should have a last status yep we do ah yikes uh, this is last time last cases um, last cases last time Okay, this is going to be uh, get the last case uh, count and last time. Then here we can do case uh, last cases 16. Oh, we can just do it at the end. So this is uh, so this is. Uh, Add the last status line, last cases time, uh, last time, 16.6f. And then in this case, ii will be len output time for 10. Whoops. Uh, oh yeah, last cases is int last cases, last time is floats last time, last time. Okay, so now data.txt should end with a line that has the exact same amount of coverage, because it will just repeat the last coverage line, but it will have the time of the, the last coverage report uh, and the number of cases. Okay. Okay. Nice. And we don't have the lock held at this point, do we? No. So it doesn't really matter how long it takes for us to write that file out because we're not going to be blocking other cores. Okay, so now this will update more readily, um, and basically uh, it will have a flat line at the end. It, it won't only have data, it, it'll have one extra data point, which is the last time, effectively. Why do recruiters care so much about LinkedIn profiles? I don't know, because that's how they recruit everyone, right? It's like kind of how people do it. I don't know. LinkedIn's kind of meh. Okay. Um, that looks good. This graph looks so nice now. What a huge improvement. 
Um, oh, is that the right coverage? Um, ah. Uh, does update uh, Python dict update or set update? Um, does this return anything? It returns nothing. <sighs> Annoying. Annoying. If PC not in code. Coverage. Currently, it's showing coverage, not code coverage. That should fix that. Now, we're seeing this is in the uh, 2300 territory. And yeah, 2296. And this should be 2296. Fantastic. And then we see the extra data point, which is just basically giving us uh, extra printing information. Okay, cool. Much better. Ah, and now that looks a little spikier. Makes sense. Um, Cause this is code coverage. I don't know why I had it in the other coverage mode. Hell yeah, we can see very, very early fuzzing. Like li literally, this part of the graph is like the first second. And we can see all of that information uh, of like all of the incremental progress. So now what we can do is copy data and we'll copy this to, uh, what configuration are we using right now? Uh, we are currently using a corpus and no dictionary. So we'll copy this to uh, a single corpus dot text. So now you should have a line for, uh, oh, that was the wrong one. Um, this one might have just been called data two. Woo! <laughs> oh no, that's no corpus, no dictionary. No corpus and dictionary. Oh, the current one is, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I don't really care about the labels right now. We'll, we'll deal without the labels. Uh, I'm not gonna update them. Basically, uh, I'm just gonna have like a new and an old. All we're gonna do is we're gonna throw in the OID thing and we're gonna see what happens. Now that we're feeding in, we're randomly adding these OIDs. So basically adding a dictionary of magic values to the fuzzer. And... Last status. Oh, I pulled it down, I guess, when it was being written or something. Okay. So, we can see, obviously, there's been an improvement. In the early phases, really nothing has changed, which is uh, no big surprise, right? I wouldn't really expect there to be an improvement. In fact, you can see that we're pretty much synced up perfectly here. Uh, once again, the time graph is basically fucking useless information. Um, it's still nice to display it side by side, in case we made something catastrophically slower. Uh, but it's obvious from this that the performance hasn't really been affected. Um, in fact, I think we actually gained a little bit of performance. Because this graph on the right, uh, in fuzz cases on the x-axis, axis is going to delete the um, time element. But it also means that we can see a lot higher resolution data of what's actually happening um, in this fuzzer. Which is really cool. Okay, so what we want to do is basically improve that line. So I'm going to make a copy of that. We're going to copy uh, data.txt. This will be to 
that, and now we should have, yeah. Um, and this is gonna be data, uh, single, no dict, dot, uh, text. And this will just be called current. Okay, and then we will go and start working on making a new corpus. Basically, you had a good way to view our progress, and there we go. So now we can kind of see the current fuzzer, and we have the single input corpus with no dictionary, single input corpus with an OID dictionary, and we can kind of compare these. So we can, um, once again, we can copy uh, data.txt to data single corpus. Now we kind of have that uh, extra tailing there, which is cool to see. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um... Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna disable the dictionary and we're gonna disable, um, we're basically recreating the data that I had early on stream. Uh, disable that and then we'll disable our corpus that I'm putting in air quotes, uh, cause it's not really a corpus. And we're basically getting the four different ones just so we can compare all of the different graphs to see kind of how they compare. Doop doop. Nice. That's up and running, and this one, which is performing quite poorly, um, is neither. So this is no corp, no corpus, no dictionary. Uh, no corp, no dict. Okay, copy data.txt to this, and then we'll run one more. What's the last one that we haven't plotted? Um, no corpus but dictionary, which is just this. Literally just doing this so we can kind of see the different behaviors of these different fuzzers in these different configurations. Okay, and now we have this one, and this one will probably underperform and then cross over is what I suspect it will do. Yep, exactly what it did. Um, just because it's going to take longer because it's corrupting more, so it's going to kind of damage inputs more frequently. Um, but it also builds uh, more complex inputs over time. So that looks pretty good there. Uh, I don't need to let this run too long. We just want to have some ref reference lines um, so we can see kind of the different performance, uh, the performance differences between these. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. We're gonna copy uh, data.txt to uh, data no corp dict.txt. Nice, and that's what we already called it. Uh, nice. Okay, so now we have all of these lines and they should be labeled. Um, obviously this is the best one, second best, worst. Okay, nice. Now that's what I call data. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to collect a corpus. So we're going to see if we can get a bunch of these uh, inputs. Um, we only have one input, so let's uh, increase the size of our corpus. That's going to be our first stage, is we need to basically create a bunch of different inputs. Uh, it's also important to note we've never found a crash yet. So... Um, even if we get less coverage, if we get a crash, that's still an upgrade. So, it's important to note that our goal right now is actually to get a crash. Um, not to get some... 
Uh, let's clean up these. I'm sick of seeing these warnings. Sorry about this. Typically don't let warnings run this long. Thought I'd be using those things, but it's been a while. Okay. Which X5 and 9 parser are you fuzzing right now? We're fuzzing Asinine, some random library on GitHub. Okay. Nice. Um, oh, and yeah, this blue line is basically another run of the orange line. And we can see that they basically have very identical shapes, right? Uh, my fuzzer's not using deterministic random, but we can see that it's finding the same shit. Uh, which is great. And, you know, I don't know if I even care about the time graph right now. So we're going to just... Uh, mm, we're just going to turn that off. Uh, this will allow us to zoom on this one better. Okay, so this is more what I'm used to looking at. And we can see that these are actually going to probably intersect at the end. So how cool is that? Look at look at how tight that overlap is. And you can see that this this bump here is the same bump as this bump, right? And this is something I've talked about before when we look at uh, coverage. Is like this bump here is the same as this bump. And this bump is this bump. And this bump is this bump, right? And it's basically because the, the fuzzer has a probabilistic chance of generating these certain things. We can also say that this bump is also this bump. And you can see that it has the same shape, right? We have these like ripple and then like these increases. We have a ripple, an increase, and another increase, right? Um, it's just pretty obvious that it's the same data. And then these two will probably hit the same point. Uh, once again, typically within like a factor of 10 uh, is what I'm looking for on a graph like this. I'm Basically, like, these orange and purple lines or blue lines or whatever up here, uh, this line and this line, this difference here doesn't mean that it's better or worse. Same with this difference, right? This is basically at the noise floor of just random chance of finding it sooner or later. So I'm, I'm not looking for an improvement at that level. I'm looking for an improvement at a much larger level when I'm trying to find things in a fuzzer. So for example, these lines are clearly worse than these lines. And I don't care about the absolute Y value. I mainly care about the time to same coverage. I, I mainly care, I'm uh, mainly looking at something that finds something earlier on the x-axis. Now when I actually radically change a corpus or a fuzzer, then I do care about the y-axis, but when I'm tuning variables, I only really care about the x-axis, because the y-axis is implied to be the same because you're using the same RNG and the same situational stuff. And there you go, there's that same bump. Um, this one and this one are, are basically very similar. Right, so everything here, this target looks very realistic. Everything in here looks like the standard shit that I see when I'm writing a fuzzer. Uh, nothing in this looks really out of the ordinary. Um, it's pretty cool, actually. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Um, and we're seeing uh, right from the earliest case, which is case number eight. So this is very, very, very high resolution data. In fact, we can't actually get higher resolution data than this. Um, we have perfect granularity on the x-axis and y-axis. We have no batching. We have no, uh, the data is not being chunked together on an interval or recorded as an interval. The data is, is literally exactly uh, as it is found, it gets recorded. So, and since there's no time factor in this, the performance and system noise is not being included in the benchmark. So what we can do is we can see, um, as I was talking about tunables, so this is the same fuzzer as the orange line, right? So we're basically comparing against the orange line and all historical ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to decrease the frequency that we corrupt the input size. We're going to increase the frequency that we uh, splice in an OID. And then we're going to increase the amount of corruption, right? And what we're going to do is see, did that help or hurt? We're basically binary searching this for whether or not those changes helped or hurt the fuzzer. 
And in this situation, it looks like it hurt it. We're behind the orange line on both the x-axis and the y-axis by a pretty considerable margin uh, in most of these places. Now, it's close, right? We actually do get ahead of it, and then we start falling behind. And once again, as we've talked about, oh, there we go. Now we're actually pulling ahead. So maybe it is better, right? <laughs> like, looking at these things is very, very, very fucking difficult, right? We're, we're trying to basically, uh, but we did hit actually more coverage than we've ever observed before. Um, I'm guessing this bump is this bump. So we made it better. <laughs> right? Like, even though it performed worse in the early stages, and this is why it's so hard to have an arbitrary delineation of when your fuzzing is done, because this might now start underperforming. If you only were looking at this data, right, if we did that, if we only looked at this data, then we'd say, well, clearly blue's a worse one. But then blue actually comes in the lead. And this is why it's so fucking hard to benchmark fuzzers on absolute values. There, there's just... It's, you have to interpret the data. The, the bullshit, like, ranking systems, I just don't believe in them. Because there's just real shit that, that, like, you need to interpret out of your graphs. Um, yeah, look at that. We, like, keep getting little Nessies on there. Very minor, but let's let's keep going with that. Let's increase the coverage, uh, increase the corruption even more. And I'm gonna change the OID insertion to uh, a random chance of inserting up to four of them. So we're heavily increasing the frequency that we inject OIDs, and we're heavily increasing the uh, corruption that we do. And let's see what this does. And look at that. Uh, it's basically at parity with the orange line. And it's hard to say if it's going to cross over. So, how to be as good as me? Practice. Practice and be critical of yourself. Don't become happy with the things that you know. Just keep looking to always improve. Yeah, it's still like nesting a little bit more, but I think that actually made it worse. I'm going to decrease the bite corruption, and I'm going to slightly decrease the... Uh, random OID insertion, but we're always going to insert a random OID. So we're going to guarantee that we insert an OID. So let's see what happens here now. There we go. That looks better. See? And basically, I'm trying to, like, A-B test things uh, to determine if there's something that is better or worse. And let's see if this reproduces. So it looks like we outperformed because we found this significantly sooner. Let's see if it happens again. Let's just fucking run it. And we'll see if we see similar, uh, similar behavior here. Yep, and we see similar behavior. Look at that. We're actually pretty much peeking ahead in every place here. Uh, which is a really good sign. Okay, so now let's try something else. Let's go and do this. And right now, what I'm trying to do is get a feel for uh, the correct amount of corruption for this target. I'm trying to figure out like a lot of different things in my head. I'm trying to figure out the sensitivity to corruption. Obviously, that made it worse. Um, now, that might have been a fluke, so we'll run it again to see if it was a fluke. But maybe... Um, decreasing the amount of corruption is helping us, and it looks like it's not a fluke. The, um, that corruption frequency is kind of directly influencing the gap between these two. So let's go to the extreme end. We were at 64 before. We're going to go to 128, so we're going to go further out, so we're going to decrease the amount of corruption that we end up doing, and we're going to see if that blue part comes out even further to the left of the graph than sooner on the graph. And my speculation is going to be no in this case. And yeah, it looks like it didn't come out any sooner, which I'm not too surprised of. We're going to get rid of the plus one so that we have a chance of not doing this. In fact, we're going to say if vm.rand mod four is zero. So we're going to have a one in four chance of inserting uh, up to th three, up to two. Um, this is going to be a one in four chance of inserting one or two OIDs into the database. We're going to corrupt uh, 60, one byte for every 64 bytes and then a fixed eight bytes. And I think this will be a better performer than everything we've seen so far. Um, yeah, that's looking pretty good there. 
Um, honestly, I think I want to decrease the amount of corruption, the byte corruption. Let's go to plus two here. That will get us a type and a length value, uh, potentially, in one case. This one, I think, is going to be really good. Yeah, that's looking great already. Yeah, that looks real good. Let's get another Nessie going. Okay. It seems like actually adding more of those OIDs really seems to kind of help. Um, which is kind of interesting. So let's uh, add that back in. We'll just make, uh, if this mod 1 is 0, the compiler will know it can just delete that. That way I can keep the logic in there if we end up wanting to use it again. Yeah. Dude, that's just better. One or two OIDs getting injected. We immediately go to 2420 coverage. Look at that. That's how sensitive these fuzzers are, right? Like, this line changes dramatically when we just change a couple of those tunable parameters around, right? It, it's just that sensitive. So let's change this to a, a over 128 and then four higher flat amounts, uh, decreased dynamic amount of corruption. And it's hard to say if that hurt us or if we just variance really well. Um, honestly, I don't think that's variance. Uh, this might be really good. Okay. That one took a while, but that one's just a fluke. Okay. It's looking good. Clearly, this is consistently outperforming. Okay, so now what we're going to do is go grab uh, a corpus. And to get a corpus, we need to figure out uh, where to get X509s. Let's see if... Uh, let's see if Bing can get us X509s. Um, damn. What's going to be a good way to collect a bunch of dir encoded files? Um, uh, file this. So I could do like a basic web scraper. Um, I could maybe go grab something from OpenWARC. But those are like relatively hard to decompress and process. That would probably take an hour or two. Um, hmm. Does Google not do file type at all? Open SSL's fuzzing corpus. Okay, these are probably pretty good. Yeah, we'll start with these. We'll just grab these. That looks, that looks good to me. I'm down for that. That's also a good place to look. Um... And then we just want X509, do we want ASN1? I don't really understand the differences. Um, oh, I think ASN1 is X509, but not in binary representation. Axeman, which downloads a fuck ton of certs from the uh, certificate transparency lists. Okay, that would be a cool thing to use. Um, storing them as CSVs, but I'm guessing I could hack it up internally. That's kind of cool. The biggest issue with uh, corpuses is you don't want to end up... Um, you don't want to end up creating a corpus from one location. Like, you don't want to scrape. 
if, if you're making an image fuzzer, you don't want to scrape imager because imager re-encodes everything. So you're not actually getting any differences in image metadata and, and formatting. You're just getting different data in the images. And you're typically fuzzing metadata. So it's really important when you're looking for a corpus that you make sure that you don't end up just grabbing everything from one location. Um, the open SSL corpus will very likely not have um, that issue because this is likely going to be a mix of known crashes. So let's copy those to inputs. Actually, we got to scoop those inputs to Grizzly. Um, okay. Um, and then for file sizes, these look pretty good. That's exactly how my corpuses look. Uh, file <laughs> input star. Bunch of dir encoded stuff. We've got some things that look kind of corrupt. But yeah, that looks that looks good. Yep. Okay. Now these are going to be great, great inputs. This is a pretty high quality corpus, um, just because OpenSSL is going to have like historical crashes and bugs that they're going to throw in that corpus, um, and typically it'll it'll lead to a pretty damn good corpus for fuzzing. So uh, let's see. Uh, what we need to do is this, uh, for fn, for file name in standard f, uh, list dir inputs, uh, let fn, uh, file name is equal to file name unwrap.path. Add something in that ballpark. Um, uh, read there. I just want to make sure the spews out the file names. Looks like it will. Good. Okay. So then we are going to read them and then resize them. Uh, buff is equal standard fs read file name unwrap buff resize um, buffer size ou8 and then add inputs with buff and then the size is equal to uh, context is input context size buff dot len context and this is a uh, resize pad to our uh, fixed buffer size add the input to the corpus okay so that should just automatically add all that shit to our corpus and this should now be part of our oh nice um that's happening, why? Does resize not truncate? Um, it's simply truncated. Mm hmm? Hmm? Um, oh, uh, dot min buffer size, the smaller of the two. Basically, we want to truncate our representation of it. Bingo. Nice. Yeah, look at that coverage now. Look at that. There you go. That's the difference of having a fucking nice corpus. See? Literally all we did is we improved our corpus. <laughs> That's it. 
That's all that changed is we improved our corpus. Like, and we're still growing uh, from that point. Uh, performance is looking good, 13 million a second. Obviously, we're truncating inputs, uh, which might be hurting some things. Okay. Ain't that nice. Uh, we're going to grab data two, will be last. Okay. I like having a last such that I can uh, rerun it. We're going to change the buffer size to 256. This is going to give us a performance speed up, but it might hurt our coverage that we can reach because we won't get as deep in some of these inputs. So we'll see. Yep, that hurt us. Let's go the other way. Let's increase the buffer size. This is not going to hurt our performance. Okay, it looks like that's probably slightly hurt us. No, it actually helped us. But yeah, our performance has dramatically decreased. So it actually, on the time domain, it has probably hurt us. Uh, which is fair, that's kind of what I would expect. So I would kind of rather, I guess this is 10x. Hmm. So basically, it's increased the quality of the uh, each individual fuzz case. And then let's go cut this down aggressively to like 512. I feel like we can express most things in that. Nice. So it's behind on coverage, so it's going to be below on coverage. But it's up on speed. And it's creating smaller inputs that hit the same coverage. I don't know. The 4096 was actually a really happy medium. So that one seemed to immediately spike. And it was doing about 10 million fuzz cases a second. Let's see what the perf is. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's in the like 10 million range. And we're getting that coverage instantly. I think that's going to be the play. Nice. Okay. All right. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to do no mutation. We're going to, um, we're not, we're not going to do any mutation. We're just replaying our input corpus through. This should just be a flat line, effectively. Yeah, this is like how long it took to randomly pick up all the inputs. I think there are 2,000 inputs. So um, this is basically without mutation, right? So our mutation is important. We can't just replay the valid inputs through, right? Our mutation is improving it. So anything above this line is basically a margin for an, for an improvement. Isn't that cool? Um, obviously it's, it's not going to grow past this point. It's run, it's run every single input through. It's not going to find anything new. Okay. So let's add a length mutation in where it's going to corrupt the length and we'll see how much we get from that. I'm basically trying to figure out the components of the fuzzer that are contributing most. Obviously the length component uh, wasn't a huge impact. Um, and actually, I want to go back to this. I just want to save off this line. So we're going to run this, and then we're going to copy this to data two so that we can see kind of this, ba this baseline. You'll notice this is common when I'm writing fuzzers as I save off these reference points. Um, yeah, definitely has capped out. So we'll copy data.txt to data2.txt. And now we have... Uh, Uh, 
why aren't those? Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so now we're gonna add in the length mutation, and anything over the green line indicates an improvement to the fuzzer from the corpus, right? Um, so we know that this is gonna be an improvement, uh, but it's very minor, right? Changing the lengths does get us some new coverage. It hits some new ed edge cases, um, but not much. Uh, okay, so let's throw in the OID corruption where it's going to randomly inject OIDs in here. And I bet this will get us a decent amount because it will. this will also double as just generic mutation. Um, that gets us a decent amount. Uh, 3235 is what we're peeking out to. 3235. So now we're going to add in the input corruption. And that's just mutating bytes. And we're at 3400, right? So just corrupting those bytes is a pretty major improvement. So that means there's like a lot of stuff. We're gaining a lot of coverage by doing our own mutations, which is pretty impressive. 2BH. Uh, given how bad our mutation strategy is. So we're going to copy the, um, the blue line. That, and save that off. And now we're going to start playing with these parameters again. We're going to decrease the frequency that we do the OID corruption. We're going to increase our base corruption frequency. And I suspect this is actually going to hurt us because we already have relatively good uh, well-formed inputs. And this is probably going to... Uh, oh, you know what? It seems to not matter. Okay, let's go extreme then. Let's uh, dramatically increase the amount of corruption that we do. And let's see if this helps or hurts. Basically, I want to see how wide the uh, tolerances are. Um, it looks like this is starting to hurt us. Yep. So that amount of corruption is starting to damage the inputs to the point we're not growing past them. But this might cross... Uh, no, it's not going to cross because it's going to be corrupting way too much. So now I'm going to decrease the corruption. I'm going to increase the OID corruption amount, but I'm going to decrease the frequency that we do it. And then let's see this one. That one looks good. 3417 right off the hob. Okay, it's, it's identical. <laughs> it's fucking identical. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so I would suspect that this will have a better slope. The blue line will probably have a better slope than the green line. Um, solely because lower corruption will typically favor, um, uh, further in the fuzz case or f further into fuzzing. But ultimately, those are pretty much identical. Let's go, uh, fire up Binja. And I think it's this file. And we'll load up the coverage data. And we'll just see what our coverage numbers looks like. Well, no, that was the wrong one. Um, 3465. Okay. Um, bam, bam. Dump certificates, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. Parse extensions, I bet we missed an error case. That's something we can't actually hit. Uh, looks like in here on a push. Okay. That we could probably hit with the correct level of nesting. That's something I would expect we'd be able to hit. Parse optional. Um, once again, another push. Um, an OID equality. Uh, basically, we've never smashed in an OID for the right spot. That's actually interesting that we've missed that. I mean, it's not surprising because we haven't done that many fuzz cases yet. We've only done like a couple billion. Oh, uh, we've only done like 100 million. No, that's 1.6 billion. Um, and no major Nessies. I kind of want to see if we see anything. So I'm mainly looking through here to try and see uh, what we're missing and trying to figure out why we're missing it. Um, ASN one time. Unknown tag here. I don't know if it's possible for us to hit that. 
Invalid year. Uh, we should be able to hit that. Uh, the fact that we haven't hit that is a little bit annoying to me. What's he doing? We're working on a fuzzer for an X509 parser. We're trying to look for bugs and something right now. Okay. Um, that's an ASN1 push. Same thing there. Key usage, no usage asserted. Okay. Push nested too deep. Uh, we're not going to be able to hit something like that with our fuzzer because we don't repeat things frequently enough. Um, too many directory names. Pop. SN1 end. Is time. Token is null. We're never going to hit that. Right? That's an error path that we'd never hit. Is string. Yeah, everything here looks pretty damn good. Actually. <laughs> like. Let's see if there's any ASN1 functions. Is that searching? No. Let's see, uh, let's see if there's any ASN1 functions that we're missing entirely. Time to string. Oh, we're not going to hit those unless we actually print out the uh, information. Time compare. Unsafe skip. Type to string. Right, these are um, OID to string. These are printing. Uh, SM1 compare or equal. Yeah, I, I suspect this code is not accessible. Yeah, that's hitting time to string. Time to string is called in type to string. And type to string is not called at all, right? So that, that, that code is completely unused in our code base. Um... We might have to find a different parser. Are, are there really no bugs in this fucking thing? I think we know of one thing that could theoretically be a bug. Um, so let's look at the ASN1 format. Um, Okay. SNMP? RDP? Serialize and deserialize in a cross platform way. Huh. So the question is, can you have nested structures in ASN1? And I think the answer is yes. Burr, der, canonical, yep. Um. So it's basically a serialized format. Type tag, length and octets, and then the thing. And then this value has a, a nested thing. Yeah. So is it required that if you do nested, you have a sequence? Um. This might actually be a really simple format that we can just parse. Let's take a look. Um. Let 
Cutting rules. Spec of basic notation. This, I think, is what I want. Okay. So, uh, recursion. Productions are to be continuously reapplied until no new sequences are generated. Um, yeah, we've got no new coverage. Not a huge surprise there. Character sets. Mm, this isn't what I want, is it? Sequence. Instance of type. This isn't what I want. Um, is this the one that I want? Octets, length octets, content octets. Indicates there are no further encodings. Okay, here's what I want. Um, so we effectively want to figure out what the shape of these files are. Identifier, length, and contents. And I don't even care about the OIDs yet. I just want to parse ASN1 structure. Um, end of contents octet shall be present if the length is encoded as specified in that. Otherwise, it shall not be present. Um, boom, length contents. So let's take a look at a file. We're going to do, um, we're going to do this. Uh, 09 F6 inform dir. Uh, dash in. Okay, so basically, I should be able to parse these um, files in kind of a generic structure like this, and I think it's just ASN one part, uh, ASN one, and I think this should be able to handle recursion and all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, yeah, UTC time, sequence, length infinite. Okay. So a D... End of contents. So this is the depth. So this will be a sequence. All right, let's take a look at this in uh, um, Okay, so here we, we're gonna parse it kind of manually manually in our big brain here. So we have a 30 hex. 
Um, so I think everything is going to have a length, so we shouldn't need to handle everything. Oh, wow, this is nice. 60 length, and then inside of it, there's stuff, strings. Yeah, I think we can do this real fucking fast. Length forms. Ah, there's the object identifier. And that is encoded as a six. So this is the type, the length. Oh no, that's a... Is that the length? Um, actually I'm not sure. So like a 1A is a visible string, and that's clearly these things. So this is all we should need to parse. A uh, sequence. A 30 is a sequence. And then a length. And then we have a sequence of shit. Um, and then that sequence has a sequence. So I think a sequence starts a nested structure. Basically, we basically push onto the stack or some, some shit like that. Um, content shell. Okay. This might be really easy to decode. Like, we might be able to make a parser for this incredibly quickly. Um, null and length. We don't actually even care about the typing. I do care about the recursion. Might be one of the design goals of ASN1. Yeah, it looks pretty, uh, okay. I mean, I don't like the, uh, the, like, the tag shit here. Um, so we start with identifier octets. Shell encode the tag, the class and number of the type of the data value. Um, they determine the tag. Six will be a zero or one, primitive or constructed. And then five through one will encode the number of the tag as a binary integer with bit five as the most significant bit. Um, for tags with a number greater than or equal to 31, the identifier shall comprise a leading octet followed by one or more subsequent octets. Leading octet is encoded as follows. Eight and seven should be in, encoded to have the tag. Six should be a zero or one, uh, according to the rules of 8125. Um, and five through one will be all of these. I see. So basically, if it's all ones, then... Uh, subsequent octet shell encode number of the tag as follows. Bit eight of each octet should be set to one unless it is the last identifier octets. Seven to one. Okay, so basically uh, this is a multi... Um, you, you get the class, you get the P and the, the PC code, then you get the leading octet, uh, or you get these five bits. If the five bits are equal to uh, 1F, then you keep reading these, and these actually compose 
the uh, tags, which you or together these components. Or, well, you shift it over. Um... Okay, and then we have length octets, definite and indefinite form. 38 in the long form, okay. So basically we, we wanna use the top bit. So th this encoding's easy. Y'all fucking ready for this? I love writing parsers. You know what, I'm gonna go make that, that spiked smoothie. Take a bio break. I'll be back and we'll start working on this parser. Be right back.
Oh, yeah. Oh, it's going to be good. Oh, fuck yeah. That's refreshing. Okay, so I think we are ready. We're ready to party. Let's, uh, let's get this going. Um, so what we're gonna do is write something that can parse this. Uh, we're gonna start off with a simple input. Let's go look in our inputs and, uh, sort them by length. Um, how do you do a reverse sort? Um, let's see if this one's good. Okay, that looks like valid X509. Or ASN1, or whatever the fuck this is called. And I'll say this is, uh, and form dir. Nice! Okay, that's exactly what we want to see. So this is a very basic, uh, very basic, ASN1 thing. Hey, Alex. How's it going? Where are those castles? Oh, there are some fancy castles. I like them. Um, okay, we're going to go into... Cargo new bin X509, uh, ASN1 parser. Okay, and we're gonna copy uh, soft serve inputs this to test dot dir. And that's going to be basically our test input file. And we'll go into okay, and let's get this going. Struct um, ASN one, and this is going to be maybe an enum. I'm not a hundred percent sure yet what this is going to be. Um, we're just going to start off with a uh, impl. ASN1 FN parse mute self um, data, which is going to be. Um, maybe we can have this be something where it's a. Do I want to do my standard shit here where I do a mutable reference to a U8? Or do I want to use IO read here? This will be more portable. I need this to work in my OS, so we'll, uh, we're not gonna do anything here. Um, the first video from the bootloader uh, didn't make it to YouTube. I can't remember why, I think we like lost power or something weird. Um, but there wasn't much in it. That was mainly, like, planning. I mean, arguably, planning is one of the important parts. Um, okay, so let's have this return. Honestly, I'm just going to have everything be an option here. I don't care about how it fails to parse. Um... We're just going to do this for now. Yeah, we're not going to do a structure until we know what we want to do. So this is a parse record, and then that will return some with nothing in it. And then let's do uh, let me buff is standard FS read of test.dir unwrap parse record uh, 
let mute pointer is equal to mute um, as slice. Uh, mutable reference to pointer. Okay. Nice. So this should get the data, which is the input file, passed into this function. And then we'll just start consuming shit out of it. Fantastic. So the first thing that we need to do is parse um, parse an identifier octet. And struct identifier. This is going to be the um, class, uh, enum class universal um, application context specific um, private is three. Okay, this is gonna be a wrapper u8 uh, derive clone copy debug partial eq eq partial ord and ord. That should be a good amount of stuff here. So these are... I have no idea what these things are, but this is going to be... Uh, um, an ASN1... Uh, ide uh, um, class of tag... Uh, eight point one point two point two. Uh, table one. Okay, and then here we're gonna say um, this is going to be an implementation of uh ASN one parsing, um, referenced by x six ninety o two o seven dot pdf, uh, sourced from blah. Let's say this. Okay. Um, it's really important to note what you're using. If you're going to have uh, numbers like this, it's really important that you kind of mention kind of this information. So we'll say um, this is uh, X690 uh, revision 07 Um, is there any further information here? Um, bink. I'm just grabbing shit out of the PT PDF such that I can hopefully uh, find this PT PDF in the future if I need to. Um, there we go. Nice. Set text width is 79. Okay, so that should be a pretty good description um, of what this is. <laughs> so, obviously we can save this. And we'll throw this into... Um, I have no problem checking this into the repo as well. Uh, X509 target, ASN1 parser, um, docs, save. Damn. Okay, so now this is literally, as mentioned, in the documents there. Okay, so that's good. We've got all the descriptive information if we do lose that PDF, and if we don't lose the PDF, well, then we just literally fucking have it. So now I can see 8122 is 
eight, one, two, two, and then table one. So that will very clearly get me to that point. Universal application, context specific, and private, uh, which is zero, one, two, and three. Um, holy shit, I've fallen behind on chat. I'm so sorry, guys. Um, sorry for the noob question, uh, but it seems like he could very easily work for Google or something. Does he not want to? Asking because I feel inadequate as a programmer because I don't uh, work for one of those companies. Um, I'm at Microsoft right now. Um, works on Microsoft. Yeah, for Microsoft. Um... I don't know. Uh, Google has interesting work. I mean, all the companies have interesting work. Uh, uh, Microsoft was kind of my foot in the door on the West Coast because I had a previous boss um, who was starting a new team or joining a team and like basically expanding it and wanted me to join and be kind of an early uh, contributor to the team. And that was relatively... Uh, pretty easy opportunity. I didn't, like, it wasn't a very, like, serious process to get in. I mean, obviously, I had to interview, but it was kind of more of uh, more a formality. Like, it was kind of a guaranteed position. Like, just because he was literally creating a team around the things that we had previously worked on before, and that was going to be a, a good setup. Google's pretty interesting. I'd like to work for Project Zero. I think Project Zero is probably at the top of my list of, of uh, teams I'd like to work on. So I think Project Zero is kind of my, my goal of where I'd like to go. Project Zero is at Google if people are not familiar with it. Um, what are your thoughts on building an AMD workstation for fuzzing as opposed to Intel? Any recommendation for CPU and RAM? Um... I don't really, like, I don't really care. I, I think uh, both Intel and AMD are pretty comparable. Intel has a couple advantages that uh, you can, you have processor trace, which is better for uh, getting coverage information for binary targets. It also has uh, execute no read uh, memory in the hypervisor, which is a technique that you can sometimes use to catch bugs uh, early or try to detect weird anomalies. Um, performance wise, they're basically identical. There's no really strong reason either. Intel has a couple more, uh, features that I think are more beneficial to fuzzing. Um, I've personally done more fuzzing on AMD than other things, to be honest. So like, uh, my hardware until very recently was all rigged up for AMD only. Um... If people like him work for Microsoft, I should really try to get in, right? Uh, maybe I'd learn much more. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just kind of how learning works in general. Unfortunately, um, it's hard to get into the places where the good people are, right? Like, MIT probably has some of the best technology learning capabilities. Like, if you want to learn technology, MIT is one of the best places you can go to in the country. But that also means that it's one of the hardest places to get into. So it's kind of a chicken the egg problem. You have to basically bootstrap yourself up into a position where you can get into those uh, privileged uh, institutions. And it's, it's kind of fucked, but also um, good people like to work with good people. And it's pretty hard to find people who want to work with people at a completely different skill level. So uh, getting into a company like Microsoft or one of the big companies is a great way to learn. Um, but there should be learning opportunities at every company. I know a lot of programming jobs are literally just churn out code that your boss tells you to do. Um, but the key to becoming a good learner is being interested in learning. And um, being interested in learning um, has to be able to work in all walks of life, right? You have to you have to be able to find opportunities to learn in your shitty ass standard, you know, development job as much as you can at Google working with amazing talents. Um, 
basically you need to find some source of inspiration uh, in yourself, right? You, relying on other people for inspiration is very dangerous. You can do it, and it is what a lot of people do, but it's really dangerous because if that person goes away or stops talking to you or stops being available, you might lose your entire inspiration for whatever you were learning. So it's really important to have a self-motivation uh, or self-need to learn these things, whether it's to fucking make more money, get in a more powerful position, who cares how selfish the motivation is, but there has to be a motivation. Um, from there, I mean, I learned a lot of stuff at jobs where I didn't have people to learn from, right? And, and I had shitty jobs where I was just doing basic development work, and I still had an interest in going above and beyond, and not doing only the things the boss asked me to do, but going above and beyond is typically how I explored uh, new avenues of research and obviously copious amounts of free time to actually do this research. Um, uh, and assuming I can't for some reason, how do I keep making myself better as a programmer? Uh, just practice, really. Um, I mean, if you want the exploitative answer, you can do like leet code and you can try and game the interview process to get a job that maybe you're not 100% qualified for, but you, like, can basically repeat the things that the company wants you to repeat. Um, that's what, honestly, a large amount of entry-level developers do, is they study uh, interview questions, right? Rather than learning how to program and answering the questions in the interview, they just study the interview questions and try to get through the interview process and then worry about whatever once they actually land. Um... I don't like that too much. I refuse to participate in that. It will affect me. Like, some companies don't like that I don't play by their rules and their games, and some people don't think I'm a good programmer because of bullshit rules like that. Um, but ultimately, I'm not interested in gaming the system like that. Uh, but that is... That doesn't mean it's not a viable route uh, to go if you want to get your foot in the door for these companies. Um... Also, don't expect only geniuses to work at big companies. I worked at, uh, I worked for big companies and can assure you uh, that a lot of idiots work there too. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Any thoughts on the new AMD CPUs announced a couple days ago? Uh, the Zen 3, I haven't looked at it yet. Thanks for your feedback. You're welcome. Anytime. One thing people forget is that nanometer isn't the same as density. Intel's 10 nanometer processes are as dense as the... TSMC is seven nanometer. Yeah, the the whole the whole concept of like lithography uh, just doesn't really mean anything anymore. So I don't really care. I just care about the benchmarks. Uh, exactly. I had a guy who couldn't declare a variable when he started, and after five months, he still couldn't if you asked him. Uh, he always asked people for help, but in reality, he wanted them to do the work. He didn't want to learn. Yeah, it's it's tough. Wanting to learn is not a choice often. It just isn't. Um, so. Uh, joining big tech is easy. Try a mid-sized company and you'll tell me. I, I don't... I, I disagree with that. Uh, joining big tech is, is, a, is a difficult problem. Uh, it, it's not easy. If it is easy, then you're very privileged. And you maybe take your skills for granted. Um, but the big, like, fang, big tech companies are, like, the top 1% of programmers. And there are many people who will never get into those positions as much as they study and work for it. Um, it's not, it's not easy when you're talking about averages. Of course, if you're a good programmer, of course it's fucking easy. But, like, you're selecting for people that it's easy to do. You know, it's like saying it's easy to be a, a millionaire if you're already a millionaire. Like, yeah, no shit. It's easy to get your next couple million, uh, but the first million's not not very easy if you got 50 bucks in the bank or even worse, 100 grand in debt. Benchmark and real world performance wise, AMD beats Intel now. Yeah, that I'm not too surprised. AMD or, or Intel has been milking Skylake for what? fucking uh eight years now probably a decade since a decade or like a decade and a half since skylake has been in like design uh, intel hasn't done anything <laughs> they've they've been pretty afk um 
of course they've done things. I'm not saying they literally haven't done anything, but ultimately they haven't really tried to go for uh, any revolutionary changes. But that's mainly because AMD has not been competition for Intel since 2005. Like, AMD has literally done fucking nothing until Zen. Um... Like, Piledriver, Bulldozer, those microarchitectures were absolute fucking trash. Those were terrible microarchitectures with major bottlenecks. Um, and AMD basically didn't produce a server processor uh, for, like, eight years. They produced some, like, very entry-level i3 or, like, uh, Xeon, um, uh, like, the 3-series Xeons, the E3s. But, like... AMD has been non-existent in the server world, and the server CPUs are where you get big money, because uh, the, the margins are higher, um, and they're bought more in bulk. So AMD kind of did some weird stuff for a while there. I think they have better um, availability of their processors now. I know for Zen 1, it was very difficult to get a server-grade processor. Uh, even in Zen 2, it kind of was. So AMD's kind of been whiffing on the server side of things, um, but I think they also know that they can just do the consumer thing, get the reputation back, and then probably transition to servers. So, um, where I live, how good a programmer doesn't matter. Recruiters are stupid. HR is stupid. No one looks at a portfolio. They look at keywords and buzzwords. Oh, yep. That's pretty accurate. Um, Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Oh, okay. Let's uh, let's get this portion going. So this is the um, class from the identifier octet. This is going to be the. Um, uh, primitive. Um, uh, how do I want to do this? Do I want to use a bool? Can I repper bool? I bet I can't. <laughs> um, I'm just going to see. I'd imagine this won't work. Yeah, you can't repper bool. Oh, that would be kind of cool. So this will be um, if true. This is a uh, constructed identifier. Otherwise, it is a uh, primitive identifier. I'm just using air quotes right now, or not air quotes, but quotes, because I have no idea what that means yet, but I don't really care. Uh, tag number. No, yeah, we'll just say number. And this is the tag number for the... Um, uh, this is just the tag number. Okay. Hey, Napalm, how's it going? Hope you're having a wonderful day. So, so this is a Rust representation of a identifier octet. Thank you so much for the 100 biddies. Good morning, it's too early on a Sunday morning to think about X509. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of in that boat. But we're chugging through. We're persevering. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> we're going to make it happen. We're mainly just doing SN1, just the TLV parsing right now, and hopefully that's going to be good enough. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is um, get the uh, first identifier octet. Um, ident is equal to... We'll probably use a consume macro again. Let's just do this shit again. Where was the last place we implemented a consume macro? We did one recently, didn't we? 
doing ace and one parsing. Pretty much only ace and one parsing right now. We, we just care about the TLVs and basically making a, next, a nested structure of lists of TLVs. Um, we don't actually care about the contents or the information that they hold right now. We're going to just treat them as binary payloads. We just want the structure uh, representation right now. Um, so, how the fuck... Where did I implement consume last? Uh, last thing we did was on read, I think. Um... I guess we're just gonna have to implement one. Macro rules consume pointer expert type type. Um, we want to make all of this fallible. We want this parser to work on hostile data. Um, so. And ideally, we have it parse things that are like somewhat broken. Um, so we'll see what we can do here. Okay. So what do we want to do? Um, if let uh, if let some slice is equal to um, pointer get uh, core pointer size of type. So if we're able to read that, uh, and we're going to map this, I guess. And then I don't know if I want to map or and then I think I want to map. So then we can do um, tie from Ellie bytes. We're mainly going to consume a single byte at a time. I don't know if we're ever really can. Ah, if we're ever really going to consume multiple bytes, but we'll see. Um, this might be kind of overkill. X try into. Um, map. Can I do that in a clean way? I don't know if there's a great way for me to do that. I can't use question mark right there. I mean, we know it's going to convert, so we can do unwrap. Um, and then can I do uh, pointers equal to pointer x dot len? Can I do that? Probably not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press X to doubt right now. Uh, can't be applied to that type. Oh, yep, semi. And we need to try into, no problem. Um, use standard uh, core convert try into. Uh, core mem size of, and a first fucking try. I'm surprised like these lifetimes worked out. Oh, I guess it's because it's immutable. So then we should have an identifier here, and it should be thirty hex. Perfect. And then if we consume again, it should be the next byte. Okay, so now we have a macro that allows us to consume. And that's pretty clean. Um, we know that's in bounds. We know that conversion will definitely occur. 
Uh, from Ellie Bites cannot fail. The size is correct. That's looking great. Okay. So we have the identifier. So then we're going to, um, I guess we'll just say like uh, identifier parse data. Ident is this. And then we'll pretty print the identifier. OK, so we'll start with that. We'll impl identifier uh, pubfn um, parse. Um, and then this will be a uh, data mute ref u8. Returns an option to self. Uh, Idents is equal to consume data. Um, get the first identifier octet. It's going to be parse a um, identifier from an ASN1 dir encoded uh, file. I think this is dir. Maybe this is not just dir. We'll just say uh, ASN1 encoded file. OK, then we're going to do uh, self class class from ident shift by uh, six. Um, hmm. We might have to do this. Uh, we know it's going to be one of those three. Uh, impl from u8 for class. Fn from. I, I guess we could technically do try from. So we'll take a look at what try from is going to look like here. Um. Honestly, I'm just going to do from and have panic in this uh, value 8 class match val uh, 0 class universal. Oh, I can do val and 3 class application class context specific. Class private. This is going to be a self. Mm, Rust isn't going to be smart enough here, is it? Does it know that's exhaustive now? Oh, Rust, did you get really smart? Uh, true. Constructed uh, number is zero. Bam. Um, did Rust get smart here? I uh, can't find consume. Yep. Bink. Um, consumes a type from a uh, pointer, which is a mute u8. Uh, consume a u8 from it. Ah, okay. Ross did not get smart. Unreachable. Okay. Uh, yeah, we don't need parens there. It's a val and three. Shift that into position, and then we can print that identifier. We see that we have a universal identifier, um, which is true because we start with 30 hex. Um, then we want to do... I didn't shift uh, five. Uh, 
and one is equal to um, if it's one. So constructed. So 30 hex, is that correct? Yeah. Yep, that is correct. Because uh, 30 hex would be um, one, one here. So that should be constructed, and it is. If we did six, uh, well, it's definitely bit five. Yeah, shift it by five, which is this position. Okay, and then we want to get the tag number. Tag num is equal to idents and ox1f. Get the tag number from the bottom five bits of the first identifier octet. Uh, if this number is equal to... Um, if it's equal to 1f, then there is a uh, large, there is a variable length encoded integer. So we'll say um, tag num is equal to, if tag num is equal to ox1f, panic, or just unimplemented, else tag num as u32. And then this is tag num. So this is a handle variable with integers. So if it is 1f, so 0 to 30 inclusive, it should comprise a single octet. So in this case, it's number 16. Cool. So universal constructed tag number uh, 16. Um, for ones that it's greater than or equal to 31, um, the identifier shall comprise leading octet followed by one or more subsequent octets. Leading octet should be encoded as follows. Yep, and then that. So 31. Then subsequent octets, bit 8 is 1 for continuation, and 7 to 1, uh, followed by 7 to 1 of the second subsequent, followed in turn by those, up to and including the last. Basically, you just append them together while the top bit is set. So we'll just say, um, let's implement that right now. Uh, vint. So this is um, a ASN1 variable length integer, which can be parsed. Um, this is of the encoded form. Um, uh, this is encoded where uh, the variable integer continues while the top bit of octets are set to one um, and the bottom seven bits of the octet are used as the seven bits of the integer. For example, um, OX80, OX... Um, Uh, would encode, and what number is that? 8F00 would be F shift 7, uh, hex F shift by 7. Um, right? Is that true? The top bit's ignored, the, the bottom seven bits are taken, we shift them by 7. And then, yeah. And then we can just say like one in here would be 781 hex. Um, okay, so this is a U32. Impl vint. OK. 
Okay. Parse a uh, variable length integer. Let um, let mute results is equal to OU thirty two. Um, the results. Then we're gonna do uh, while um, loop. Uh, let byte is equal to consume data u8. Get a byte. If byte and ox80 is zero, break. This is um, uh, we consumed the last byte. Right. We consumed the last byte, um, return out. Okay. Uh, get the bits. Bits is equal to bytes and ox7f. Right? So that's going to be uh, get the bits, and then we'll just do uh, res shift equals 7, res or equals bits. Uh, okay, it's not perfect yet because it doesn't handle uh, overflows. Here we'll just say return uh, sum self res. So if the top bit is not set, Okay, so let's just try and parse one of these quick. We'll just try uh, let mute pointer is equal to uh, uh, this is just going to be the test 8f01 print as hex vint parse pointer um, mutable pointer get a few eight uh. yeah, it's fighting me Okay, uh, v int 781 hex, and that should be correct. Do they give an example? So this would be 201. So the length is also a variable. So let's see if we decode that. So that would be 81 OB 1100101. 81. Oh, wait. The number of subsequent octets. Oh, so they use a different thing for that. So the length octet is a completely different one. Why Why do they have to use multiple variable length? Uh, it's so stupid, man. One, unless it's the last. So what do we do? Um, if the top bit is zero, then we return it out because it was the last and we already uh, accumulated that information. 701 of the first octet, followed by 701 of second, followed by 701 in each further octet, up to including the last and subsequent one. Um, with bit seven of the first subsequent octet as the most significant bit, 
bit 7 through 1 of the first subsequent octet shall not all be 0. 7 to 1 of the first subsequent octet. What? Um, I mean, that makes sense. We would never encode that, but we technically handle decoding something of that format. So then that one obviously fails because it can't consume enough, but that would be C9 in this case. Let's see if we can find an example. Um, I think we have an example. Um, length 8185. Eighty-one, eighty-five. Oh wait, oh that's yeah, that's length eighty-five. Um, the record is sixty. I'm trying to find an example, just so I can make sure we're looking good. I think this one should have it. Here we go, contents. So, eighty-five seventy-one. So let's try it. C two seven B, and then we'll print it not as hex. Eighty-five seventy-one. Yes. Okay. Not. I'm not surprised. So. It's a relatively easy one to parse out. Basically, consume it, shift over the results by seven, and then take in the uh, bottom seven bits and just keep shifting that in. So, clearly, that works. Now, what we want to do is actually um, uh, checked shift left. And effectively, what this is going to do computes that, returning none if RHS is larger than or equal to the number of bits in self. So, um, res uh, checked shift left by seven. So that should be the same thing. Oh, you know what? That's actually not gonna do what I want it to do. That's actually not what I want. Effectively, what I want is if I do something that would overflow the integer, right? That'll overflow the integer. I want this to fail rather than just keep shifting shit off. Um, I mean, I don't care too much, right? I don't care too much. Um, I don't know if it's worth the perf hit to do it correctly. Ooh, did we get new coverage? Yeah, we got two more, uh, we got six more coverage. I think we were at 75 before. Let's take a look at, uh, that graph quick. Ah, I forgot where the graph was. I think we hijacked one of the terminals. Um... What do I want to do if if res leading zeros is less than seven, return none. Uh, check if we have room for storing more bits in res. Okay. Nice. So if the leading zeros uh, is less than seven, then we have a bit one set in one of the top parts and we're gonna lose information. Now we could theoretically have 80, 80, 80, like we could have a bunch of 80s 
But since they're not encoding any top bits, this should work, right? So like 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 01, right? We don't end up overflowing our U32, so we don't really care. Now, nothing is going to actually encode like this. In fact, that's not a valid encoding, but who cares? Um, basically, if the number of leading zeros is less than seven, then we're going to shift off a bit. Basically, check if we're going to shift off a bit. Um, And then uh, shift it by seven, and then or in those seven bits, and this should be perfect now. Um, and that will correctly fail to parse something that would overflow, but something like this that a lot of parsers would struggle with, it is fine with because it just knows it's a repetition and there's not actually a loss of information. It's still encoding, like in this case, this is just 71 hex, or if we put it in hex, we'll see it's uh, 71. Oops. Right, so that's looking good now. Um, do you ever do fuzzing and try to find collisions in crypto? No, not really my cup of tea. Um, okay. So now we can just say this is going to be variable int parse data that uh, dot zero. So basically, uh, parse out a variable int. So if the tag number is 1f, then we parse a variable int, which is following it. So basically, we get the class, we get the, um, the PC, and then we just eat the rest of it and grab that variable length int, uh, parse that out, and that would be the tag number. Otherwise, uh, if it's not 1f, then we just give the tag number and promote it to U32. So that, uh, this should now be parsing the identifier octet. This should be a full identifier octet parsing. Cool. Then we need to parse a length. So we'll do a struct length. We'll parse that into a u size. And we'll do that up here too. Um. Uh, okay. Uh, you size. Bam. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing here. This is an ASN1 encoded length. The length may either be a... Um, can be encoded as that. In the long form, the length octet shall consist of an initial octet and one or more subsequent. Bit eight must be one, okay. Definite and indefinite. Definite form, length octet shall consist of one or more octets. Shall represent the number of octets, wait, what? Um, one or more octets shall represent the number of octets in the contents octets using the short form or long form. Short form can be used if it is less than or equal to 127. Basically the top bit. 
Short form, bit eight is zero. Seven to one encode the number of octets in the contents octets, which may be zero uh, as an unsigned binary number. Okay, so the length may either be um, a value from zero to 127, uh, inclusive, or uh, is a, um, or the first byte indicates the number of bytes which compose the length. Uh, for example, uh, OX7F means the length is OX7F, um, uh, OX8182, uh, 10 means the length is OX10, right, 0010. Um, bit 8 shall be 1, the number of subsequent octets, this value shall not be used. This restriction is introduced for future, or for possible future extension. Um, okay. Um, according to 8.1.3.5 note one, uh, OXFF is an, uh, shall not be used. Bits 8 to 1 of the first subsequent octet, and that are shifted together. Uh, 201 is this. So 2. 1 byte, and then it's a 201. Yeah. So that's 201, right? Uh, uh, OB1100101 is 201. Yep. We just or all those things together. Uh, impl... Uh, impl length, parse, uh, parse a ASN1 length, let, uh, um, short is equal to, uh, consume data u8, uh, get the short form, if, Shorts and OX80 is equal to zero, then sum self uh, short and OX7F. Um, short form, just use the bottom seven bits, else this. Bam. Um, U32, okay, we don't have it. So check if it's the short form. If it is the short form, then it's just the bottom seven bits that we want to use. Uh, long form, the bottom seven bits indicates the length, uh, the number of bytes, a number of octets making up the length. So length, length, <laughs> we're just gonna call it length, length. I'm actually okay with that is equal to short and OX7F. Oh, and we're gonna say if short is equal to, um, yeah. Uh, OXFF is an invalid form. So we'll say if short is equal to OXFF, uh, reserved for future extension. Um, if short is FF, return none. Okay. Otherwise, get the length length. And now this is effectively the same logic as this, but slightly different. Uh, let me res is OU size. Um, the return results. 
four blah and zero to length length. The fuck do you do if it's zero? Um, some self res. What's eighty? Um, oh, and then for the indefinite form, the length octets indicate that the contents octets are terminated by end of contents octets and shall consist of a single octet. Wait, how do I know what the indefinite form is? Length octet shall consist of one or more octets and shall represent the number of octets in the contents of octets, either the short form or the long form. Short form bit A to zero, seven to one encode the number of octets, which may be zero as an unsigned binary number. So we've zero to 127 are accounted for. Long form, the octet shall consist of an initial octet and one or more subsequent octets. Bit 8 shall be 1. 7 to 1 shall encode the number of subsequent octets in the length octets as an unsigned binary integer with uh, bit 7 as the most significant bit. And that encoding, all uh, FF, should not be used. 2 1 can be encoded as that. For the indefinite form, the length octets indicate that the contents octets are terminated by end of contents octets and shall consist of a single octet. Um, the single octet shall have bit 8 set to 1 and bit 7 to 1 set to 0. I see. Else if short is equal to hex 80, uh, indefinite form. Right? So if it is exactly hex 80, and then in this case, we get the length length, zero to length length, and get the byte. Uh, make sure we have room for eight bits, get eight bits. It's just a uh, byte as u size, and that's it, right? So for the this, we get the, if the top bit is zero, then it's the short form. If the top bit is zero and uh, is, is eight, uh, if the top bit is set and everything else is zero, then it's the indefinite form. Otherwise, the top bit is set and it's the long form. Take the short form, get the bottom seven bits. That's the length of the length. Um, which is guaranteed to be one or more. Get the return result. So we'll get a uh, result, which is OU size. Then get the length length. Um, for each of the bytes, consume it. Check if we have room. So if the number of leading zeros is less than eight, then we're going to have data loss when we do the shift. Otherwise, shift that off. And or that in, and this is uh, accumulate the length. So shift it by eight or in the byte. Okay. Nice. Uh, length is equal to length parse data. And let's see if we have an indefinite. We do. We have an indefinite form. For the indefinite form, the length octets indicate that the contents octets are terminated by end of contents octets and shall consist of a single octet. Fuck this, man. This sort of indefinite stuff is so stupid. 
Um, C815. The end of contents octet shall be shall be present if the length is encoded as specified. Oh, and I think this requires use the definite form if it's primitive. Use either the definite form or the indefinite form um, if the encoding is constructed and all immediately available. Use the indefinite form if it's constructed and not immediate. Okay. Um, the end of contents octets can be considered basically a zero, zero. So at this point, that's going to be an indefinite. Um... Okay. Um, I don't think you can do that. I don't think you can do self colon colon like that. Oh. Okay, you can. I feel like I've tried that before and it didn't work. Noise. Some self in death in it. Bam! There we go. So we have an identifier, universal constructed number 16, and it's in the indefinite form. Okay, and then that means we should have another one. A! That's the end right there. There's another end. Yeah, that's the end. Fuck yeah. Obviously, this is going to be incorrect. We're going to say if um, let uh, length definite length is equal to length, um, data is equal to ref uh, data length dot dot. So basically consume the data. Bam! Unwrap on a nun 192. Um, oh yeah, and we haven't checked the length, so we'll do that. So get the length. If it's a definite length, then do that. Um... Okay, uh, oh yeah, and we should have, uh, let's just do a Rust up update. I think we might be on an older version of Rust, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so 
So we're failing because we're unwrapping that. Interesting. I don't know. Oops. Um. Test utter. One three zero. Um. Oh yeah, I get to the end. I yeah, I parse it. I parse the whole fucking thing. So I'm a champ. Hell yeah. That's that's pretty good. So parse the identifier, parse the length. If it's a definite length, then do this. Otherwise, I guess we want to. Um, So I guess sequences basically make it nested. Uh, so I can do like, let me depth is zero. If ident is equal to identifier class. Um, Um, can I do this? Uh, oh, do I need curly boys or uh, perenny boys? Looks like I might. Noise. Um, depth plus equals one. Um, false. I don't know what the constructed is. I think constructed means I want to recurse. Uh, if depth is zero, break. Minus equals one. Fuck. So this will be the depth. That I guess that doesn't decrease the depth. Um, Tagged value. Okay, let's see what this uh, constructed means. Alternative indicates that the contents are are terminated by end of octet. Ah, end of contents octets. Okay. Um, all extensibility markers in choice, sequence, and set are ignored. Uh, 
I think constructed means that it has it's a it has sub ASN one in it. How do I know when it's done? I guess I need to recurse, don't I? So we can say if ident constructed parse record data. Um, I guess I don't need that. We don't loop anymore. If it's constructed, then recurse. Um, get the ident, get the length. If it's constructed, then call parse record on data. Which will then come through and consume things on data. We're basically passing that pointer through over and over. Um... Hmm. Um, if it's not construct, if it is constructed, I definitely don't want to do recursion, uh, recursion. So um, if it's constructed, else, hmm, how do I want to do this? If it's constructed, I basically want to parse all the fields. Um, so what we can do is, um, match length. If it's a length, um, indefinite. Length definite. Uh, temp is equal to uh, data dot get uh, len get len bytes. Unimplemented. Okay, so I don't know, unless I want to do recursion, but I don't think so. I think recursion will kill me. And I suspect recursion will break a lot of parsers. That's actually something that I really want to be able to represent quite well. Get the identifier, get the length. Uh, if it is a constructed identifier, then we have multiple fields. Otherwise, we just have one of these bad boys. Hmm. OK. 
Okay. So we print the identifier, then we go in, and then we consume the next thing. Oh, if it's not constructed, we're just done. Okay. Let's try it a little bit with recursion. If it's indefinite, then um, struct record is going to be a um, ident, which is an identifier. We're going to have a length. And this will be a record. Bam. If it's not constructed, then this is just a sum self. Record. Uh, sorry. Whoops. Uh, self. Ident length drive debug on that. Uh, we'll say record for now. We'll change that to a self in a minute, depending on where we end up going with this. Uh, if it's indefinite, then we want to do loop. Um, record is equal to uh, parse record data. Um, if record is equal to um, if the identifier is equal to this end of contents which will be a identifier class universal constructed false uh, we can do this uh, const end of uh, contents is a record Ah, let's implement uh, partial EQ and EQ on this. This is a record where the record has a identifier, which is um, it has a class and a constructed. And then another thing, which is the number. Damn, didn't fit. Okay, identifier and length is a length um, definite zero. So this is a record which ends an indefinite length field. Okay, we're gonna say if the i if the record is equal to end of contents, then break. Otherwise, keep consuming that shit. Uh, in this case, we'll just return none. It's gonna cause an unwrap failure, but that's fine. Oh, and we can put a question mark on that. Uh, capital D. Nice. Uh, here we'll parse our record. And then we'll do uh, data is equal to data.get record. Um, 
Oh, we don't do that. Len dot dot. So if it's if it's definite, then we just get oh. I see. So this is loop uh, while there's data here. So this is uh, while let pointer is equal to um, data get to length, um, get the payload while pointer len is greater than zero, make this mute pointer, mute pointer, um, I don't like the indefinite encoding, that's really fucking annoying, um, Data is data dot get len dot dot advance the data pointer. Dref. Uh two oh one. This one's a record. Because we are recursing right now. So if it's constructed, we want to parse ASN1 internally. Otherwise, we just want to get the record. And in that situation, um, Use the definite form if it's primitive. Um, if let sum, if let length uh, definite len is equal to, okay, this is kind of the main thing I was looking for, is this uh, 8132 in the spec, uh, basically saying that this form, this definite length is, uh, if it's primitive, you have to use the definite form. Um, none uh, cannot use the indefinite form for a primitive. Okay, advance the data pointer. And okay, so we get a record. So we parse an ident, we parse a length. If it's a constructed, if it's not a constructed identifier, then um, it's a primitive one. And thus we get the length uh, from the length, which is guaranteed to be definite. If it's not definite, then it's invalid. Um, if it is definite, then uh, advance the data pointer, pass the length bytes, and then just return out the record. Okay. And then it doesn't like these up here. Yeah. So here we parse a record. If it's end of contents, then we return none. And then in this one, we just return none. Basically, uh, consume records while the length is greater than zero. Uh, consume records. And then... Uh, advance the data pointer because we haven't advanced it. So here we just get the payload and then we actually advance the data pointer. This should be pretty much correct. Um, ident length. Uh, 
16 indefinite, 16 indefinite. Then we have a primitive. Um, which is one byte in length, which we see. We consume it. We then see a constructed sequence that has a fixed length of three. And... Um, integer one, then a length three. Then we have a three byte thing here. It's an object. Um, that should just be a TLV. Yeah. So we have the six. Really? We have nothing. 231. Data get, data len, len, advance by len bytes. So prior to parsing that record, we should have three bytes there. A 612B. Yeah. Um, and that's good. All right. We clearly have some stupid bug here. Should be able to figure this out quick. Um, oh, because we returned none. Same with here. So obviously we need to accumulate the nested thing, but we're just gonna do this for now, bink, just so we can parse it. Okay, unwrap on a nun. Hmm. We shouldn't be hitting that. All right, we're not hitting this, are we? No. Um, if it's end of contents, then break, return the record. We just discard that. Hmm. I guess we want the last... Thing. How do I want to indicate that? I, I think that uh, effectively the problem is uh, I can come through. I've parsed everything, right? Uh, so the end is the 50 byte thing, and then we have the end of contents. Uh, the problem is we don't know where we're at the end of contents because this is returning. I need to have like an end of contents indicator for this. I guess I can just return record. Uh, some record. Is that wrong? Yes. Um, ooh, can we have a definite with an end of record? No, that would make no sense. So basically parse the records. If it's an end of contents, then we'd return that out. And this is causing us to terminate early now. Uh, 24240. Or I guess we have indefinite zero, zero. So those are our generalized times. And then we have an end of contents. That's ending 
this sequence. Okay. And why is that a problem? We return end of contents. Don't I just want to break here? Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I'm like in the right ballpark of what I want to do, but it's not quite exactly what I want. Uh, if we made it to end of contents, we want to break, of course, and then we want to return this record. Um. Problem is that doesn't know we're at the end. And why doesn't that know we're at the end? Uses Linux, must be a hackster. Oh yeah, very hacksor. Very hacksor. Um Parse, parse, ident length. If it's constructed, it may be in the indefinite form. If it's in the indefinite form, we want to parse records until we get to end of contents. Um, and that should recurse. Then we return the initial record. Which would then be a problem for things that call parse record on an indefinite thing in an indefinite. I think I need another signaling mechanism here to basically indicate that we popped out. Um... Loop parse. Let mute depth zero. Um, if it's a constructed identifier, depth plus equals one. Otherwise, it's a primitive. If it's a primitive, then we do this. Uh, in this case, we're not actually returning anything yet. We're gonna get rid of recursion. So we're not gonna recurse anymore. Uh, some, we didn't want recursion anyways, cause it's bad. So we're gonna rewrite this to not use a recursive algorithm. And to do that, um, If it's constructed, depth plus equals one. Uh, get the definite length, uh, update that. Cannot use indefinite form. This will just be return none. Basically say that it's invalid. Perfect, so that's going through. That's basically parsing everything, but now we need to handle this uh, state here. So if it's constructed, depth plus equals one. Um, do I need a state machine if I want to do this? Uh, let me data is vec new. Uh, data dot push vec new. Um, can I make this work? If it's constructed, push a new thing. 
that's going to be the vector that we're on. No. I need a stack. Um, basically, when I get to... Um, if I get to ident is equal to end of contents, oops. If it's equal end of contents, did it up pop. If it's constructed, push a new vector. Oh, fuck, man. This is going to be really annoying without recursion. Is that hacking? Yeah, we're hacking right now. So... Can we do this without recursion, without having really ugly code? And I, I don't know if we can. Because if it's indefinite, then we want an end of contents. And if it's not indefinite, then we don't want an end of contents. Um... So, I basically need a stack of, like, processing, which is a uh, vec new. Okay. Then, if we have a constructed type, then we'll do processing push. Um, uh, uh, um, processing push. My brain's going to mush. If I want to make this without actually recursing a null function, which I do want to do because that's something I want to be able to represent. Um, dude, stack exhaustion is probably going to crush a lot of these parsers. Processing dot push vec. No. Do we want a vector? No. We're going to push what we're processing. We're going to push the length. Um... We gotta do big brain. So um push this constructed state onto the stack. And this is just gonna be parse the primitive. Uh, it has to be a definite. We just consume it, and then we move on. Okay. Now what we need to do is... Um, if processing len is zero, then break. So this is... Um, uh, break out of the loop if we're not processing anything. So that's our little processing stack. Uh, 
the first one's kind of annoying. Maybe I just parse that shit. I don't want code duplication here, and that's what's annoying. Um, if I parse the data, parse the length, and then I have those identifiers and the length. We print those out. Uh, if it's constructed, we push something into processing. Otherwise, do that. Um, I guess I want to track uh, bytes consumed. Okay, let's do this. Slit consumed is equal to um, data dot len minus init len or whatever we called it. Yep. Prints consumed this. Yeah, a classic. Um, So this will say the number of bytes that were consumed. There are two bytes consumed. Um, we want it at this stage. The number of payload bytes consumed. And then we want to subtract that off of the definite count of the stack if it exists. Um, shit. So that will give me the number of bytes that were consumed. Basically, uh, parsing the primitive is the only thing that would consume something. Um, if Ident. Okay, uh, what's our processing stack like? Let's print that. Processing.len. So this is basically our stack depth. And that should be accumulating. Okay, it is. Um, and what we need to do is if let sum uh, processing is equal to processing get uh what's the is there a last or end or something no there's pop but that actually pops things off and that's not what i want so basically Parse the primitive, get the definite, consume that off. Uh, return none if there is an indefinite form of a primitive. If there's a constructed type, then we push the constructed type info. Const we determine the number of consumed bytes, and then we want to subtract that off to... We want to subtract that off of a definite form... Um, if processing.len is greater than zero, then we want to do if um, if length definite ref mute len is equal to processing processing.len minus one. So get the last entry, and we want to consume things off of the length of it. Len minus equals consumed. And... Uh, 
Oh. A little curly boy. And then mute on that. Plan is equal to processing.len. This is an annoying Rust thing. Unfortunately, we just have to go with it. Get the last entry. Ref mute the last entry. Uh, decrement the consumed. And then... We should be able to print the length. Basically... Ah, yeah, here we go. So we have a constructed definite form 3. Um... Oh, but the TLV structure matters there. You could use last, maybe. Yeah, I, maybe. I could do, like, iter last or iter mute last. It, it, that would be cleaner. Um, but this logic is not perfect. So in this case, we have a constructed thing here with a definite length of three, and it only has one thing in it, which is this. And it's only decrementing it by one because this consumed doesn't include everything. So if we do this, then we'll get a sub with overflow. We have a definite three. Um, hmm. We want if processing len is greater than zero and we didn't just add the thing to processing. Uh, and... Is this only if it's primitive? I think so. I think this is only if primitive. So if you say, if not ident constructed and that, then that goes to zero. Um, so we should be able to do uh, this iter mute last this will be if let sum ref mute beautiful um i don't think i can just do last directly yeah iter mute last subtract of consumed i can't pop that because i'm borrowing it um, pop is equal to this, um, len is zero, else false. Why does that seem tabbed fucked? No, nah, it's fine. Uh, if pop processing dot pop. Uh, pops, uh, if we consumed everything off of a definite. Yeah, let's fucking go. Nice. Look at that. So we had a two, introduce a new definite, and then we pop that fucking thing off of there. This is wrong. What a fucking terrible format. If it's definite, we want to subtract it off. But... This is a problem... Right. Uh, 
Um, this definite one. Length minus equals consumed. Like, that's just so fucking stupid. The fact that you can't, like, really initialize it as an... I mean, I guess... I should push a uh, length definite onto the stack for the root, um, which wouldn't be too bad. Um, attempt to subtract with overflow, uh, 213. Assumed. Should make an HTML or XML fuzzer? Those are easy to fuzz. Because you don't have to have as well formed of a parser. You can kind of kludge it together and you can get a lot done. Um. Why am I subtracting with overflow here? Oh, um. I'm actually really surprised by that. Uh, consume should be three. Oh, because we're fucking up other definites. <sighs> Basically, the problem is we don't... Uh, we do want to subtract things off if we are handling a next... Thing. So we have a constructed type here, process this, we subtract that off, and that's good. Then we get to this phase. We start a new definite, um, indefinite. We have a definite one. We haven't reached the end yet. We have a definite three. But it's a constructed type. Hmm. So, what the fuck, man? Indefinite identifier. So, I feel like I don't want to subtract the length off in all situations. Uh, I don't think that's true, though. Indefinite. Yep, that pushed a thing. Indefinite again, that pushed a thing. We have a definite. The last thing is not definite, so we don't subtract anything off there. Once a, Now we have a constructed thing that has a definite. And the problem is we don't want to subtract off if we just pushed it on. Um, so then is this correct? If it's a, a constructed identifier, then we just push something on. Okay. And then two, three, we push a definite, we're on the stack. 
That's our third constructed. And we pop it off because we're done with it. Then uh, we consume some, uh, or that one we don't have an indefinite is the last thing on the stack. Here we start another indefinite. We have a definite, a definite, a definite. And then this one, we want to basically kill it. Um, pop, if we have a definite thing, then we want to pop, we want to remove consume, and we want to pop it if the length has reduced to zero. If it's indefinite, uh, okay, let's do this. Honestly, do I just put a, a definite on the processing stack at the start? Because that's kind of what I'm thinking of doing now. Um, so if there is something and it's a definite, if there is something and it's indefinite, then we want to pop it if and only if the um, uh, record is equal to record ident length. Um, okay, so if the record is equal to end of contents. If we don't have something on the stack, if it's not constructed, While processing dot len is greater than zero. Okay, I think we're pretty much there. Here comes the last part. We're going to have processing start as a vec new. We're going to do processing dot push. Um, length. Uh, definite data.len uh, push the entire uh, data as the as a definite record right so then we get down to here um, it should be impossible that we pop something off if if this is a none this is basically a uh, unbalanced um, stack. And that should be impossible. That uh, shouldn't be reachable. And then basically, this determines if we want to pop something, and then pop something in that case. Are these indefinite forms used by X509? They should only be used by st when streaming data? I'm not sure, but this is for ASN1. So we're not too concerned about X509 right now. Okay, 241 unwrap. So we'll print we'll print the processing. And processing starts as a definite 100. So we have, basically we have a hundred bytes that we want to process. Um Push an indefinite, another indefinite, a definite three. But we're not changing these 100s. Oh, yeah, this is wrong. Basically... Uh, when we pop things off, we need to adjust things below on the uh, on the stack. Am I even going about this in a good way? 
I feel like it's okay. Is it normal to design, uh, especially design a fuzzer for a target? Yes. Yes. For offensive work, not for defensive, but for offensive work, yes. It's basically required to find Ode. Um... <sighs> yeah, this definite needs to get adjusted when we pop down to it. And to do that, we could basically store the length of the data along with this such that we can compute the number of bytes that were actually processed when we consumed the thing at the end. So processing push data.len and then we get to here uh old len same thing here old len so basically that will allow me to determine the um, the amount of bytes that I need to adjust when I pop on it uh, when I do a pop. So if I do a pop here, I then know um, no. I can just go by the fact that I'm consuming data, I think. Mm, I don't know. One, two, three, three, four, three. We have the indefinite. Definite, definite, and then this one should pop, and it does. We, we had a constructed definite zero. What the fuck is that? Did we parse something incorrectly, or is that literally how it is? We have a length zero sequence. Okay, so that actually exists. Uh, I bet that's why this is in the corpus. I bet that's the weird edge case of this input that's strange and causes bugs. Um... While pressing one is greater than zero, go through. Yeah, we're not adjusting these definites that are early on, so we don't know what we're actually consuming. I guess we could walk through the entire stack and subtract them all rather than just one. So if it's not constructed, then we can... Yeah, that's not going to be right if we have a definite and a definite. Yeah, fuck this format, man. Um... Dude, this format is so fucking annoying. Hmm. So if it's not constructed, then we want to... Yeah. 
God, I'd imagine most of these have fucking stack bugs. I guess you can just have a recursion threshold. If it's constructed, push the length. If it's a primitive, then we simply consume the primitive bytes. Indefinite on a primitive is not valid, so we'd return none immediately if that happens. We get the number of bytes that were consumed, and I think what I want to do, if the identifier is not constructed, I think I want to do this for all down levels. Um... Like, it's annoying because if you have a definite and then an indefinite in the definite, you need to subtract that you consume from the definite below. Um, or I'm doing this in a dumb way, which I think I'm starting to do this in a dumb way. I think I might be better off if I actually just save the, um, if I consume, maybe like processing could be a slice to the data and I just always advance data. Hmm. But I eventually need to actually construct this into a meaningful structure as well. Dude, I hate this format, man. I don't want to use a recursive function either. If you have a... I don't know. I'm just not really thinking clearly anymore. Um... The indefinites need to basically build off of the definites. And they need to consume the bytes from the definites. And the metadata of the indefinite itself needs to consume off of that byte. But in the indefinite ones, the metadata doesn't consume from itself. It's, like, really fucked in that way. And I'm trying to think of the best way to track that without adding way too much state. Parse the thing, get the record. If it's structured, then we push that length. Mm. Like serializing it is really easy, but deserializing it makes it a lot more annoying. I mean, maybe I'll just make this a recursive function and just make it super simple, and then we'll just add a, a limitation on the recursion. I think we're gonna do that. Uh, it's gonna be easier to think about. Obviously, anything that you can make with the recursive function, you can do without a recursive function as well. But in this situation, we're not gonna do that. Okay, so. If it's constructed, But then this you have to know when it gets to the end as well. Which is a pain in the ass. I basically need a flag. Do I need a while loop here? I can't recurse. Hmm. 
Hmm. Did I even care about the like stackness of it? No, I, I do have to care. Like, that's not even that trivial. Okay. Why do they have to have fucking indefinite indefinite? That's such a fucking stupid concept. How about you just do fucking fix-ups? It just adds so much state. Like, oh, whoops. Like, There's just not a great way of doing this in a in a super performant way. Like, okay, I have a definite thing. And basically Like I could go through everything below me and if it's definite subtract off what I've processed So I could do like four blah uh, four processing and processing dot intermute. Um, is there a way I can skip the last thing? Skips the first n, returning the last. Hmm. Um. I can do length minus one. I was looking for a cleaner way. Go through each of the things in the processing stack. Okay. Match processing. If I I is equal to processing len minus one and pop. We only, we only want to pop if it's the last thing on the stack. And we only want to do that if it was consumed on the last part as well. Uh, fuck, I can't pop in here. Okay. I don't know if I can safely do that. Uh. So for each of the entries lower, match uh, if let's uh, length definite ref mute len 
is equal to processing uh, len minus equals consumed. Yep, that's what I was expecting. So, basically we parse that identifier, we consume two things off of there. We push an indefinite, we have another indefinite which will subtract two more things, we have an indefinite again. We have a definite one, that's going to be three bytes that get consumed, popping that to 93. We then have another definite three, which is going to, um, oh, and that's a constructed. So that has no payload, it's just simply the um, uh, type and the length, which will subtract two. We then push a definite three. We then have a definite one, uh, non-constructed. That is going to be three bytes. We're going to take three bytes off of that as well as three bytes off of here. We'll end up popping that because we go to zero. Then we have a definite zero. Um, yeah. If length is not equal to length, Definite zero, push it. And that, 100%, that's why this input exists. Like, I, I'm pretty sure that's why that this input exists. Um, uh, it's guaranteed that processing len minus one will not subtract, uh, will not underflow, so we're good on that because we know that processing len is greater than zero. Uh, so basically, um, decrement lengths uh, below us in the stack. Mm, I don't like this algorithm, it kind of sucks. Whoa. So what's going on here? Definite. A new indefinite. This is, uh, oh, a definite zero, which doesn't push anything. Then we have an indefinite, which will push another indefinite. This one will pop one off. This one will do nothing. Then we have a 16 indefinite. We have another indefinite. Definite, definite. Definite zero. That will pop one off. Then we have a 50. Um. Ah, yeah, it's right. It ends on a four, or for us, that's a, that's a three, because we're uh, basically one indexing by pushing a, an empty thing under here. Um, this is basically an incomplete uh, dir. This is probably a previously known crashing input. And then for us, we're not happy with it because uh, 253... That's going to fail at this stage. Um, yeah, and that's fine. What does indefinite mean in this case? It means that the uh, there's no length for the field. The length is implied by the members, uh, which is a really stupid way of doing it. But it's it's for streaming data, so you don't have to go back and fix up lengths. Um, but yeah, I think this is correct. Now, can we do this in a better way? I don't like the way that we're subtracting things off like that. 
Um, so then down here, we get to this. We then pop those two things off. Unless that's a valid one. But I'm guessing you're not supposed to end on a depth three. Hmm. Like HTTP? Uh, yeah, pretty much. So... Question is, is this valid or not? Um... I don't actually know. Hmm. Okay, um, so now how do I actually construct the data that I want in this stack? Um, basically all the primitives will get added onto this stack. It's kind of pointless having indefinite form inside of definite. Y yeah. That's what's super fucking annoying. But it's allowed. Hmm. So how do I want to construct this into a tree? Cause that's what I got here. Um. I think when I do a pop, I think I push the primitives, right? I think I push the primitives onto the this processing, I think I have a vec new, and I push the primitives onto the processing last. It's guaranteed that I have a last. Uh, I need to ref mute that, don't I? Uh, as me. Okay, and then I have the length and then the actual thing. Okay. Uh, 222, okay. So this now just says vectors. It's not gonna build because it doesn't know the type of that vector. Um, yeah, so what I want to do is when I process a primitive, I'll just do, um, Is everything just going to be nested? Kind of? Uh, 
Um. I'm not going to have one unified type for these structures. So, like, I can't necessarily just have a vector because the type of stuff that I'm going to store in them is going to vary. Hmm. Let's see. I can maybe make it work. Um, so what is it going to look like? What What's the actual structure going to look like? We're going to basically have a vector. And then inside of here, we're going to have a, one or more vectors, which could basically be nested. And then they will end up, like, internally, they will contain a... Um, identifier and a length. Oh, but I also want to encode the, um, I want to encode the length. Fuck, man. Because I'm popping things off, and effectively I want to accumulate the primitives that go onto those. Processing dot intermute last as mute unwrap dot one dot push um, record. And this should have a clone and a copy. Okay, so now what this is gonna do is it's gonna have a list of all of the things that are stored at all of the primitives that are stored at that level. Um So, that's looking pretty good. Record identifier. So we have our, our record, which is the definite thing that we just read. Then we have a definite another thing that we just read. And then we'll pop that off and we'll throw it in the trash. What we want to do is when we pop, So when we get to the end, we basically have nothing on that. I guess we have a couple things that have accumulated onto the last one, but when we pop something off, we actually want to store it. Have you seen ASN1.js? I have not. SN1 JavaScript decoder. Oh, interesting. Pretty nifty. Um, so, I'm struggling to think how I want to actually accumulate this data. The problem is when I pop, I don't actually want to pop something because that ends up with me removing it. Um, hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. Definite. Yep, we have two bytes left. And then we consume those two bytes here. And then that leads us to having zero bytes left. Um... While processing length is zero and processing zero um, dot zero is not equal to length definite zero. Okay, so now we're not panicking, right? So while we have stuff on the processing stack and the uh, we haven't consumed everything, but I, I still don't like the way that we're doing this. We we can definitely find a d better data structure for this, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, so we're popping stuff off and then we're losing information, and that's because the information that we pop off we need to store. Um. Let me data is vec. Uh, this is going to be like pro, um, we'll call this structured. So when I pop something, let data is equal to this. Um, and then structured dot push data, and that's effectively going to have all of the things that we ended up popping off. Uh, we can pretty print that. So we'll put some, uh, some of these bad boys. Just so it's clear where that starts. Okay, so the problem is we now don't actually retain this in the structure that we need it to. Um, can I do a structured resize processing.len vec new? Probably not, because that needs to implement copy, I'd assume. Um, while structured.len is less than processing.len, structured.push uh, processing uh, vec new. Oops, structured. And then structured, um, let plen is equal to processing.len. It's going to get the depth of that. Yeah, we want it uh, actually after the pop is actually correct here. While it's less than plen plus one, push vectors, structured plen, push data. Okay, so we have a. Okay, that's not how I wanted to do it. Shit. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, we basically transposed it, and we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. If I push, the thing is, if there are two things on the same level, I want to combine them into a, a, a list. Um, oh, this is annoying. I think I did this the wrong way. 
I did this in a stupid way. If it's not definite zero, ah, I need that though. So I need like, basically as I'm traversing it, I need to make things in structured. And Hmm. I know how to do recursive functions, but we're not doing this recursively. We want to do this all locally in one function. Well, the processing length is greater than zero. Like, we could make this lossier and kind of just not care as much about the lengths. No, we need to know that because that gives us the leveling information. Ha. Ah. I don't know, I'm trying to figure out like what information I need and don't need, but I kind of need everything out of this. Um, do I even want to push the definite for the first one? I don't think so. Everything will consume off of data directly. So we can do like while data.len is greater than zero. Let's go to this for now. Zoop. Uh, ident length. So basically while we have Oh, and there we can just print the record. I forgot we added the record stuff. Okay. So, I basically need to track the length of the current record on the stack. Um, and then when I pop back, I need to basically record the length that I consumed at that level. So I kind of need like a consumed at level such that when I go up a level, um, and that has to also be on the stack. Like, almost all the state needs to be on the stack here, and that's what's kind of annoying. And then I also need to construct another mm, kind of stack-like structure that has the actual records that we processed. Um, How the fuck do I want to do that? So I need to track whether or not it is indefinite or definite. If it's definite, I need to track the number of bytes that are consumed. 
such that I know when I'm at the end. Zoding, thank you so much with the raid. We're struggling right now. We're struggling real hard. We're kind of spinning. <laughs> it's it's not great. Um. God damn it. There's just so much fucking state. How's everyone doing from Soding's uh, channel? What were y'all up to? Are y'all up to some fun stuff today? <laughs> we're, uh, we're, uh, doing some dumb shit. We're trying to, we're trying to parse a very basic data structure, and we're trying to figure out how we want to organize stuff in memory, and it's becoming really difficult. We're programming in D? What? D, the only language that has FFI bindings to C++. <laughs> D's nuts. I've never actually programmed in D. Is there like any reason to use D? What what do you even use for a D compiler? <laughs> are there any D compilers that are like maintained? <laughs> That's actually kind of interesting. Thanks for all the follows, everyone. Um, welcome to the programming stream where we are uh, burnt out and struggling to make any progress and have deleted more code than we've written in the past three hours. Three compilers, an original one, LVM-based and GCC-based. Ooh. Ooh. Huh, so people actually kind of have done some stuff with D. The fact that there's an LVM based one is like kind of impressive. What's the front end for it? Delang? <laughs> Delang? <laughs> Thanks for all the follows. Hell yeah. Oh man, we're struggling. Oh, it's bad right now. Uh, we're basically trying to figure out how we want to parse ASN1, which is really fucking hard because they have both length-based fields and fields that don't have a length and they have a, like, end of... They have, like, a terminator field. And to process them, we basically need to track the length as well as if it had a length. And if it didn't have a length, then we need to be looking for a terminator field. And if it did have a length, then we don't need to look for a terminator field. And then the lengths have to basically propagate upwards or downwards, whichever way your stack grows. We have to basically adjust the lengths of thing be things below us. So we need to have the length of number of bytes consumed as part of the stack. It's 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 gross. These use for Serpent OS's package manager. What? The D community is interesting. They don't care about popularity of the language. They just silently do their own thing. Yeah. I'd imagine as such, because I don't I don't know if I've ever met a D programmer. Remedy uses D for some stuff in their games. What exactly? I have no idea. Oh, that's so weird. That's so weird. Okay. So we need a stack. Um, we need a stack which will basically keep track of the current thing that we're processing. And I think we'll have number of bytes consumed at that level, as well as the number of bytes remaining, or none. So what we can do is uh, level is equal to vec new. If the ident, uh, what is it? If it is a constructed identifier, otherwise, um, okay. So we get the record. So if it's a constructed thing, then we want to do level.push 
and will push the length of the thing itself as well as the number of bytes which were processed. Bingo. Uh, if it is not constructed, then we can get the length from if let song, uh, if let length um, definite length is equal to length. So this is a primitive type, must have a definite length. Else, then we'll do um, return none. This is uh, indefinite length on a primitive is not supported, uh, is not valid, and thus we return a parsing error. Okay, so then in the case that we have a definite length, then we'll do level dot uh, if let sum. So if we have a primitive type, I think we want to like track the lengths as we did before. So what we'll do is uh, data is equal to or star data is equal to data dot get length dot dot question mark. So this is uh, consume the data of the primitive type. Uh, let start len is equal to data dot len. Let consumed is equal to um, start len minus data dot len. So this gives me the number of bytes that were consumed while parsing both the header and the payload of this data. And then I think what we want to do is say if, if it's not constructed, this is basically the same code we were writing before. If it's not a constructed type, if it's a primitive type, no, even if it's not that, uh, and this is where it's annoying, Oh, do we just want to continue here? No. Hmm. Um. I don't think I'll ever like Rust syntax at all. What do you like about the Rust syntax? It's fantastic. It's so good. So, the top level, this needs to have Let's try this. Length dot dot. It's basically saying um, uh, get a sub slice of data starting length bytes in, and dot dot is just selecting to the end. It's the exact same thing in Python as like data is data length colon, right? It, it's, it's the same thing. Okay, so then, if it's a constructed type, then we want to do a level dot push length as well as consumed. Uh-huh. Um... So, basically... When we get to the very first levels, we'll push indefinite with a uh, two bytes being consumed, such that uh, then we process and do these two, and then we'll accumulate when we pop them down. So if it's constructed, we add that. Um, otherwise, uh, level last, 
Um, and this is kind of a weird problem. Can I get to this stage without having level set? And the answer, I think, is yes. Um, if it's not a constructed type, it's a primitive type, just consume that data. That now basically has consumed the primitive or has consumed the header of a constructed type. And then we can include that. The length itself doesn't actually include... Oh, that's annoying. So the length of the... Mm. So we have like the TLV, uh, the, the TL, kind of the header is what I'm calling it. And that length doesn't matter for, hmm. Definite three, then we have two. It matters for the level below. So I think I need to push this. So now, this will track the length, the number of bytes that were used in the header of creating this level, and then the number of bytes that are in the body of this level. <laughs> Which is kind of gross. So if it's a primitive type, so constructed types are always going to push. If it's a primitive type, then we'll do uh, level dot iter mute dot last um, basically get the last thing and then uh, dot two plus equals consumed. Okay, so now uh, primitive types will update the consumed amount uh, and we'll do um, last is equal to level intermute last so get the last thing and then here we'll say last plus equals consumed we'll say if last dot two the number of bytes consumed is equal to um, the hmm if length definite of last two is equal to the last dot zero, then panic. Basically, that's when we need to pop and we hit it. Okay, sweet. So uh, now we can do level dot pop. That parse everything? How? Uh, the levels are off because we also need to do this. If this or last dot uh, or um, last dot zero is equal to length indefinite and uh, last and idents is equal to end of contents. So if, so at this point we will say, if we have consumed all bytes for this level, or we, um, if we've consumed all bytes for this level, or we have, uh, or we hit the end of contents for an indef, in its um, level, then we're done at this level. All right. Expected identifier. Oh, um. Okay. Nice. So now we have the uh, an incorrect number of levels. Uh, 
Um, level dot len. And this is fine. Uh, and the reason this happens is because when we pop, let's, um, that's the length header consumed is equal to this. Here we need to do a level iter mute, uh, I guess. I'm going to print this popped. This is going to basically have the, uh, at this stage, this is saying there's two bytes, then three bytes here. Oh, do I need to propagate that all the way down? I do. So maybe the old model that we were doing was kind of correct. Um, Basically, if I pop something and we consume bytes and there's something in the stack that has a definite amount of bytes, I mean, do we really care? No. Because if it's indefinite, then we're using the lengths inside. So this will give the header length and the actual number of bytes processed. And we pop that off because we uh, finish up that whole record. Get that record there. Definite zero. So if we have a an indefinite in a definite, we'll actually have the correct length. That will be. the consumed plus this. Basically, it only matters if we have a definite. So what we can do is we can say if um, yeah, we only have to propagate down on a definite. If let Length definite. Do I want to subtract from that? No. I guess I can just propagate down. If let sum blah blah ref mute x is equal to level dot iter mute last x minus equals. And then this is popping the level. Um, length. Um, header payload is equal to this. Header plus payload. And that's going to have an unwrap. Okay. Yep. God, I fucking hate this format so much. So fucking stupid. Two twenty six. Um. I don't want to subtract off the header always. I only want to do that in some situations. And that's where it gets so fucking annoying. Like... Go through here. Oh, and here we want to only do this if that and length is not equal to length definite zero. And we're still subtracting with overflow there. Oh, 
No, we want to plus equals this. That's what we want to do. So if uh, if we have a constructed type, if this, if it's a constructed type, if the length is not a definite zero, um. There, we want to get the last add to the consumed. Hmm. Is this right? I think it is. But it doesn't have all the info that I need. Hmm. So, start with an empty stack. We start an indefinite. There's two bytes for the indefinite, zero bytes of a payload. We have got another one. And then we have a definite non-constructed type, which is then three bytes that we consumed for that level. We then have a definite length here. Uh, this is a constructed definite. So then we're going to push this. We have a definite three now. Uh, two bytes for the header. Then we're going to process one thing in here, which is going to be three bytes, which is going to make that go to three. which means the length is going to match the length of this, which means we pop it off, and then we return back the actual length of the stuff. Uh, in this case, we had two bytes plus three bytes here. And we had three bytes here. Because um, we had a, yeah, we had a definite here. Okay, okay. That's not bad. That gets us to eight. We've got another constructed, which is we're going to push this on, which is another two bytes inside of there. We then have a definite of zero. Uh, length zero definite, we push that onto there. We have another zero length definite that we push onto it. We have a... Uh, that's an end marker, and that end marker will cause this 2 and this 4, and the end marker, so the end is uh, 3 bytes, no, it's 2 bytes, plus 2 plus 4 is 8 onto that, which goes to, into 16. We then have a constructed 0 length thing that we just ignore, which we need to actually change that. Okay, and then we have another constructed indefinite. We push that onto here. We have another constructed indefinite, so we increase the stack again. We have a definite 7, uh, which is 9 when we include the header. We've got a definite 5, which uh, 9 plus 5 is 14, plus 2 for the header gets us to 16. Um, and then this is an end marker again. We pop that back down and we store that into here. And then we have a 50 byte thing that we consume that puts us to 72. And then we get to the end. Uh, once again, we have another end uh, marker, which would then cause us to return with a final level of this. Okay. So this is what we have, and this should account for all of the bytes that were read. So we know that we have a 100 byte input, and we have two bytes of the first header, two bytes of the, uh, oops, 
two bytes of the first setter, two bytes of the next setter. And then 92. I guess it's 96. Test dir is uh, 100. So. Hmm. Oh, we're missing bytes from the zero. This one. Yeah. Uh, because there are two empty records, which would get us to 100 bytes. Basically, we want to do that in this case. So let's see if we can handle a definite zero. If definite, uh, last two plus equals consumed. Is that unconditional in this new engine? I think so. Uh, update the number of bytes in the last level, uh, which were consumed. This is actually going to be wrong. Yep. Um, if I don't, if it's not constructed, then we should have this, right? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah, here's the here's the magic logic that we need to add. Okay, so what? Didn't we just have that in the else before? Ah, the definite zero. Okay. If I didn't not constructed, if it's a primitive type or the length is equal to length um, definite zero. Fuck. Because so I would get the last level. It would update the consumed. It would then check if it's equal to the length. Um. Yeah. How do I how do I encode that empty field? And if I'm always doing header plus payload, then I should be fine. I think this is maybe the edge case where it matters. Um, so we can get the last. If not constructed, then we want to do this. If not ident constructed, or length is length uh, definite zero. Bam, 296 two. That adds up to 100. Um, uh, if the type was primitive or the length was zero, uh, then check if we are done with, the, uh, then we could potentially be done with this level. Check if we need to pop the level. 
right? So if the type is primitive or the length was zero, so if it's primitive type or the length of the definite is zero, and I think this is now correct, um, if the number of bytes consumed is equal to the length of the definite or it's indefinite and we just handled an end of contents, then uh, pop the last entry, which will give us the header bytes and the payload bytes. And then we want to add that. If we have a level below us, um, then we want to add those bytes to it to indicate that we've handled that. And that has led to this. If we were to have another end of record and end of contents again, that would cause the uh, 90, uh, 96 and 2 to collapse down into the bottom two, which totals, basically, these should always total the true length of the input, and they seem to. So that's pretty good. If it's a constructed input, uh, push onto the stack. Okay. What's the point of a mutable reference to a slice instead of a mutable reference to a slice? Um, this is basically a mutable reference to a reference to a slice, um, which means that it's basically a, a pointer to a pointer and a length, and it allows us to adjust the length of the slice. So we can kind of consume things off of that slice, and the parent will be affected by it. Basically, the, the parent is passing along their slice, which allows us to slice it up even more, and then the parent can uh, observe what we consumed out of it. It's basically a, a reference to a slice. It's not actually a, a slice itself. It's basically a pointer to a pointer. Is this correct now? Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. Let's just print the ident. Um, we end with a three and a three. Yeah, so zero, one, two, two, three, two, two. Three two two, three three three, two two, uh, three four four four, and three three. Uh, okay, everything lines up there. And then our end condition is we run out of data. But I think this is good. If it's not constructed, it's a primitive type, so we want to consume that many bytes. Uh, we want to determine the number of bytes that were actually consumed. If it's a constructed type, then we want to include the header. And do we ever use that field? Yes, we use it here. And that needs to be separate because of this comparison. Um, yeah. So this is the number of bytes that were consumed at this level. This, this is the size that was consumed for the header. And then when we propagate downwards, uh, we update that information. So if the, length is, if the definite length matches the end, uh, basically if we've consumed everything at this level or this is an indefinite level and we just got to the end of contents then we can pop this level which will give us the the size of the header of this level and the payload and then we push that information down to the level below us because the header and payload were technically read at this level i think that's correct now um and then we also always push these. We never filter those. And then we pop these uh, things. Um, OK. 
Hein? So we have a length, identifier length, and then a value. And I basically want to push those at all the levels. So now we actually need to construct the data. We can also have a mutable, mutable reference. Yeah. Um, that would just be a, a, a reference to someone else's mutable reference. Then we're going to have the actual data. When we push a level, we'll make a vector. No, because we're making a tree. Uh, why can't I think through this? Um, hmm. Can we even do this? I think I need an enum because I, I effectively will want something like this where I will have like a ident length data. Um, and I need an enum for this because that's two different types. But what if I made everything always be a vector of at least one? Then am I fine? No. Shit. Can I do this in Safe Frost? Like, actually? Hmm. I think I have to have an enum. You can do something along these lines. Um, Let's see. So I'd have the bytes here. Match the first thing. Get the length. Not quite. Like, I, I mean this, like... There, there's a couple of things in here that make it difficult. Uh, this is dynamic length, and this is dynamic length, right? So the composition is a dynamic length, and the length is a dynamic length, uh, which means everything in here needs to accommodate that those can change. But I think that's okay if you adjust all these things. Um... Yeah, like everything is dynamic, which is kind of annoying. Um, yeah, but you're doing a recursive function here. And yes, this this is best suited for a recursive function, uh, but we're not using uh, recursive functions here. So, I think I need to make an enum. And... Um... The enum is going to be a, a field, and the field can either be fields 
uh, which is a vector of fields. Or it can be a field, which would be a uh, record and uh, the raw payload. Let me fields vec new. Okay. Um, is there a good way for me to construct this? Basically, if I do a push, hmm. Oh, that's kind of gross. Um, I need to be able to go through this and basically construct the tree as I'm processing it. And how am I going to traverse that structure? I can have a stack of the current thing that I'm processing. Hmm. Hmm. Problem is, this is a tree. And so how do I know which field I'm currently on? Do I record a pointer to the field? But I don't know. Hmm. So every time I push something, I've made a new record. But I can't do the pop. Um, when I do a pop, I actually have to just go minus one on fields. So I have to have like fields active indexed or something like that. So like basically when I push this level, um, yeah, I don't know like a great way of doing this. Fields push, um, this is a constructed thing. So this is a field fields vec new. Um, but that's not right. Cause it's feel, uh, gross. So what I need to do is I need to know, hmm. This is going to be a tough one. Um. I need to know the depth in the index into the fields. 
Because it's 2D here. Hmm. Unless I can build it on the way back up. Which is what I'm doing here. And I think I can. I'm pretty sure I can. Um, let's throw these onto here. Vec new. So if something is a primitive type, then Um, level, uh, or last dot three dot push. It's just a, a holder placeholder. Then we have the, this is a vector. Of th yeah, 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 this is correct. Um, okay. So these are the fields. Then at the top level, we have fields. And we can do fields dump. Um, if let field fields x uh, z is equal to fields uh, ref mute fields stop push or z dot uh, extend from slice ah! push fields And this is a field, fields. So we're gonna wrap the vector up. Um, did we shadow? We did. Um, ref mute. Uh, we'll just call this Z. Oops. Uh, fields. So get the fields. No, it is, uh, it should be Z that has fields. Fields is going to be a vector, I think. No, we can't do that. Um, we're going to push, uh, field, field, um, record vec new 242. Okay. And then we want to get the fields of the level above. And we want to push the fields from ours. And that's a vec. Um, I guess we know that's going to be a vector. So it's a vector of fields, which we can turn into fields. Field has lost all meaning to me. Um, Z. This is kind of what I was expecting is we'd be chasing this problem a little bit.
Okay, um... And yeah, that's a Vec field. Um... Uh... Do I just directly Z push it? I think so. Yeah. And then that is on a uh, level. We pop that stuff down. Let's take a look. Oh my god. We did it. We did it. We have an indefinite. Oh, it's not right. Wait. Um... Constructed, constructed. We want to be inside of this. So some of it's okay, but it's not it's not complete yet. Um, we have a problem on the root level one. And that's because we never pop it down. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, so the, the problem is, it, it, it is correct, um, but we never actually end up popping the fields down um, because we end up at stack equals three. So what we can do is um, while level is greater than zero. Now, I don't know if this is just an invalid input, but let's just give this a go. Um, oops. While level dot len is greater than one. Get the last. And basically we collapse that down. Um. Last. Fuck yeah. Yeah, baby. So this is basically collapse it down to the final level. Um, oops. Let's take a look. So what do we have? We have an indefinite that sets our depth in. We're now depth in. We have a fields, uh... So the indefinite has nothing else at this level. We have fields at this level because we have another sequence. Um, that sequence has an integer. This is the integer field. Then we have another sequence, which has a primitive object of length 1, which is this. So we have a definite length 1, which is this integer. We have an object length 1 here at depth equals 3. Um, then, uh, also at depth two, so this is depth zero, uh, 
Okay, so then we have an empty thing here. We have an empty sequence. We then have another... Uh, what do we have, actually? Oh, did we lose some of these indefinite fields? Yeah, we need to push those on. Um... So I know that we start with an indefinite, but we end up actually deleting some of the indefinite fields, I think. Because like here, we know that we have a field in here, but we actually don't know the encoding type. Um, Um, ah, 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 field, fields, record, which is for the constructor, vec new, Now, this is going to be mad at me, 227. This is kind of what I was intending to do. Um, if let sum, uh, if let uh, field, fields, field, um, is equal to uh, last dot three ref mute fields fields I'm gonna comment this out temporarily Um, a field has the type and then that. The Z push, this is now what we were trying to do before. Uh, we'll just say Z again. So now the uh, now we should have the typing information of it, and then we should be able to collapse this down. So we should know how it was encoded. Uh, same logic here applies. Let's go. Uh, we don't need this anymore. Come on, baby. Uh, okay. So this is saying we have an indefinite. And that's this tuple, which matches up to there. Okay. So we have an indefinite um, first level. Uh, that totals up to everything, which is good. We then have a, another indefinite, in which case we have a record which is saying that we have an indefinite length type 16. And then these are the fields that are at that level. And we actually never go below this level. Uh, so that is uh, D equals one. Um, and I actually want to collapse this uh, one further back as well. But let's just take a look. Um, yeah, let's see if we can get that working. Mm, yeah, um... It's this. This should be the fully collapsed one, fields. 
That should be the one borrowed here, moved here. Oh yeah, that gets moved into that level. Where should I start learning nodes from? Uh, I'm not familiar with what you mean, like Node.js or something else. Or I mean like when we're saying nodes for this data structure. We're basically making a tree. Fields doesn't implement copy. Yeah, so we move that into We do a pop. Um, yeah, so we have to do that. And then fields is equal to fields, fields. Um, Uh, what's the first thing on there? The length? We need the record, I think. Because I don't know what the record is of the very first level, right? No, I should. Oh, is that this? Is it correct? Um, okay. Oh, I had a space, didn't I? Bam, clear, this. Okay. Here's what we have, fields. I agree, we have a list of fields. It starts with a uh, indefinite sequence. We then have another indefinite sequence. That indefinite sequence has these fields, so we never go below this level. We have one field here, which is a definite length one. We then have a sequence with a definite length three. That sequence contains one object, which is a, um, uh, a length one definite field. Then we get back to here. We're now back up. We popped up to this level again. We have another sequence. Uh, this one is length zero. There you go. There's the length zero uh, definite sequence. Then we have a. Then we have an identifier again. This is a, another sequence. This is an indefinite sequence. These are going to include these three. We're gonna have a um, uh, a zero length. This is a generalized time zero length. Generalized time zero length. Zero zero. This is the end of content. Then we have fields again. Uh, we have a, a constructed sequence. Um, this one's a, a definite length zero. So there's no fields as part of that. Then we have a identifier, indefinite. Um, so this is this. Then we, inside of that indefinite, we have another indefinite, which is this. And then inside of here, we have a length seven key. We have a length, five definite. We have an end of content, which will cause us to go up one level. Then we have a definite 50. 
Then we have an end of content and then we brrrp all the way through. Bam! That's it right there. That is it. Fuck yeah. Okay, uh, that's good, that's good, this is good. Uh, level and length. If it is a primitive type, then consume the data of the primitive type. Now, we need to, uh, actually store the data of that. Um, so if it's not constructed, if it's not constructed, then we need this data. Um... Do I need to do this here? I need to consume this so I know how much was consumed. Um, that condition is impossible. Uh, I want the link to the spec. Uh, I don't remember which one that we're using. I think it's this one. Oh, that's a local one. Um, this. Okay. Okay, if the non-constructed type, if it's not a constructed type, then do this. If it's constructed, then we want to push it onto the stack. We can do that right away. The consumed would be acceptable there. Um, yeah, we're going to restructure. Okay, consumed is just going to be start len minus data dot len. So we're starting a new thing with fields in it. Then uh, at this level, um, do I need last? Ooh. Uh, let payload is equal to data dot get length uh, get the actual payload it is mainly for getting last. We'll have to basically re get last, I think. Hmm. Um, So let's mute payload is um, let payload payload is none payload is um, sum data gets length fuck yeah then. If ident not constructed, we know that we hit this. If we got to this stage, so we can actually unwrap this. This is a field. And here we can do payload unwrap into. Yes. Yes. I think. That unwrap is safe. Uh, payload, basically, I didn't constructed. We have to go through here. In fact, can we do this? I don't think Rust allows this.
Yeah. Um. Payload is equal to this. Basically, payload is just empty in this case. It only matters because in this case, I didn't not constructed. This is just saving uh, accesses of last a couple times. We could technically restructure it where we do it all in here and don't have to actually do that like that. Uh, but then we have to get last a couple more times, which might not be free. Um... Okay, so uh, 42, is that 2A? Let's just, uh, we'll hex print this. Hey, 2A! And then we have an object, which is org. Who knows, some magic thing. Uh, then we have some more objects. Then we have a bit string there. Okay, that looks pretty good. Is it ready for fuzzing? No, not at all. Um, this is uh, collapse down um, unterminated records uh, into a root level. Um, this is only needed if the ASN1 didn't end of contents. Um, uh, all uh, indefinite uh, data streams, um, and thus we hit EOF on the file uh, prior to uh, popping all levels of the uh, of the tree of the uh, file. So while level dot len is greater than one then get those levels so now i'm just curious if i have any bugs here start len uh record the initial data length so we can record how many bytes we consumed okay uh, parse out the header for the record. Then this is going to be, um, push on the stack. If it's a primitive type, we have to have a, a definite length. We actually get the payload. Update the number of bytes, um, Uh, which were consumed at this level. Um, let's see this. Update the number of bytes which were consumed at this level. This is uh, get the current level. And then this is uh, push the current field. Uh, push the current primitive type onto the uh, fields for this level. So basically, um, else return none, um, impossible state, no, uh, no fields. Should I just make this unreachable? Can this happen? Um, no, because if we push onto level, it's the fields encoding. Um, uh, not be possible to reach as anything on the levels, uh, on the level stack will be uh, typed as field fields, right? Basically, anywhere that we push 
uh, which is just here, level dot push, we only push a fields type. And so here we're just basically getting access to the fields type, and it's impossible that it's not a fields type. Um, at this point, it's possible that we just have a naked primitive and we're not actually part of a level. Um, but I don't think that's a valid uh, file format. If it is, then we'll worry about that later by just adding our own level. Okay. Same thing here, uh, level.pop. Then we get the last thing. Okay, so what's going on here? So if else, we have all if else is here, if else is here. Uh, there's some weird stuff in here. So if it's a primitive type or it's a zero length, then check if we need to pop up. Um, if the definite, uh, if it's a definite, ah. If it is a definite level and all of the bytes have been consumed at that level, or it's an indefinite level and the record that we just processed indicates that we're at the end of contents, then we want to pop off this level. That unwrap is fine because, um, it's impossible that we have a valid last, um, right? Because this implies that we have a last. And if we have a last, uh, so we can say unwrap is fine here because uh, we got last, which ensures that there is at least one entry on level. Okay, and then here, um, and then this is going to be um, collapse the level uh, down into the lower level. Else return none. Um, Yeah, if last is none, then we don't have a nested type here. This is going to be basically, um... Um, no level below us. Uh, we popped... I, I don't think this is possible. Oh, I, I think there is an edge case here. Basically, if we end up popping, if we added a couple more end of contents onto this file, we would end up with this state where we'd end up popping all the way down. And we also have this issue here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put unwrap on that. And I'm going to mark this unreachable. Okay. Um. Mm. I might need to unwrap on args, I'm not sure. Obviously that can crash, but we don't care. I uh, just ref it. Now we can give it a file name. Okay. A two ninety five. And why did that happen? Okay. 
Let's get the level. Um, huh. I bet the length's fucked. No, definite 129. Okay, and we can get the number of bytes remaining. Uh, 130 bytes remaining, definite 129. Let's just see what happens if we do this. Well, what can return here? These can return. And we have a definite 129, 130 bytes remain. We have questions there, indefinite length here. Uh, it's one of these. Really? How? So nothing in here can return. We have one return there. That leaves... It's the extra byte. Okay. Header too long, error in encoding. And that's after the 129. Okay, I think we I think we're right then. <laughs> I think we're right, because this fails as well. Header too long. Nice! Do you have another Durn here that's not fucking corrupt? Nope, that one's fucked too. So, I'm going to make a copy of test.dir and basically I want to put, um, I want this one to not need to be collapsed down. Uh, test two. Yep, so that's not going to collapse down because we're, we never pop all the way down to level zero. We're basically at level three, so we need three nulls. What's the best way for me to do this? Um... Mm. Test to that dir. Yeah, I'm a fucking champ. Hey, unreachable code 267. Okay, so that's what I expected. Um, basically, it's because we don't have a root level. So, um, create a root level that will never drop below. Root. Mm. 
so level dot push um we have a length definite no i want like a special meaning to the root okay maybe i just want to handle the root in a special way um uh there's no lower level we're done processing I don't know. Do we want to do that? Uh, return some fields. Okay. Uh, here we can say uh, we've popped all levels. Thus, we've made it to the end. So, if there's no last... Uh, we've made it back to the uh, root level. Level zero three. Two ninety three. Can't move out of Vec. Uh, bam. Okay, so, uh, test. This is not going to return the right thing. We need to collapse everything down into the root level. So now that will be correct, and that should be identical roughly to this, except this will uh, terminate these final fields and will make it to the very end. Okay. Have we thought of all edge cases? If there's not enough data for an identifier or length, then we return none. That's correct. Uh, we push a field structure. The payload is set to a zero length thing. Um, otherwise, it's a primitive type, in which case it has a definite, uh, definite length. If it doesn't have a definite length, then we return none because it's an invalid type. Uh, we save off the payload slice, and then we advance the data pointer past the payload. We calculate the number of bytes that were consumed. We get the last level. Um, This could happen. This could happen if a file uh, is just a, uh, if it's just strictly a primitive type. So we'll do uh, ddif is dev zero, of is uh, test three dot dir. Uh, block size is one, count equals three. Uh, count is two. Zero, zero. This should crash. Do you know to unwrap at this level? Correct. Um, uh, if let some last is equal to this else um no more levels uh or like no root level um no root level just return the primitive so here we'll return uh return field uh, uh, field, field, field of a record and a vec u8, which is the payload. Mm. 
Uh, sun. There we go. So basically, um, this 00, zero file, uh, it has no root level. Uh, and since it has no root level, there's it, it's simply just a field. Um, right? So basically, we have this file, which is just two nulls. And those two nulls uh, don't actually indicate any constructed thing. And since we have no constructed thing, when we try to get the last thing, we fail. Um, and so what we do is we just return the single field. And that will never cause us to return out early, because if we, if we have nothing left on the... If we have nothing left... Okay, now let's try this. I don't like that. If data.len is equal to zero, um, uh, we consumed all data, uh, return out the field. Um, there's, uh, extra, there's trailing data, uh, return error. Okay, so that's now an error, and a two-byte file is not an error, right? We're going super strict, um, and I like that. I think that's a pretty good shape. Um, if, do we have any unwraps? Those, those are the use of this library. This one is guaranteed uh, to be fine. So this one, unwrap is fine because we have last. I agree with that. We want to do the same thing here. Um, so um, test two, this one will parse. Um, what I'm going to do is add an additional trailing null. OK. That return path is here. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to say if uh, data.len is equal to 0, else uh, return none. And this is trailing data, uh, return error. And this is uh, processed all data. Um, return the fields. Bam. So this should return an error uh, because of this trailing uh, data. And if we go back to this and we change it to only be uh, the correct amount, it will fail because fuck. Um, uh, trailing two. Oh, maybe I fucked up my number of, of these bad boys. Oh, I definitely did. Okay. And this should be an error. Yep. Cool. Okay, any more unwraps in here? No. Any other early returns? Oh, we have this unwrap. Um, while the level is greater than one, pop and get last. Uh, the level length has to be at least two for this loop to occur, which means that this pop is fine. Unwrapping that is guaranteed, so we can say, uh, Unwrap is fine, since len must be at least two for this loop. And then, uh, I'm going to unwrap that as well. Um, unwrap fine again, because uh, we still have at least two for this loop, 
right? So we pop one, and then we get the last entry here. So we pop it, it might, uh, the worst case scenario is the length is two. Uh, we pop this, the length is now one. We get the last thing on here, so this is unreachable. And this one is as well. Um, impossible, uh, uh, we don't even need that, it's just implied. Okay. Okay. Uh, for arg in args one dot dot. Maybe use next back instead of last in 301. Um, is that the same thing? Is that what I was looking for earlier? The fuck was my Rust documentation? Double-ended iterator. Like, why wouldn't I just use uh, last? Is last on an iterator where it actually consumes it? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you try printf this? Yeah, that's fine. There's no end of contents, yeah. And that's just that's just known. Irrefutable if let. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um Thanks, Rust. Okay, yeah, having that uh, for no end of contents is totally fine. Um, Cause that's, that's just how it fucking works is sometimes things just don't have end of contents and we need to unwrap all the way down. But yeah, that correctly marks it as fields rather than a single field, right? If we do zero, 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 that one is just a single field um, and basically it's that bit that determines whether or not it's fields or not. Should be a parse error? Uh, it can't be. Because once again, they made a weak ass file format, as one always does. Right? Because this is a valid, this is a valid Dern coded thing. And we have one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight sequences, and we have three end of contents. One of them is a fixed length, another one's fixed length, but TLDR, this doesn't end of contents everything, right? And this is a valid file, because that's just how this shit works, apparently. Apparently, it just, if you don't end of contents, then you just, it just all ends when you get to the end of the file. It's a, once again, as happens with all of these fucking internet standards, everything's incredibly lossy and they don't actually use anything strict in their formats. Doesn't check for unbalanced EOC. I mean, pretty sure the spec allows that. Um, and a contents octets. Okay, let's see what we got here. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, I could make it strict, and that would be easy. According to Wikipedia, then two end of contents octets must terminate the content octets. Well, then I've yet to see a cert that actually follows that fucking format. Let's see if I can save a cert. Hmm... Uh, I need an example dir then. Uh... <laughs> Both of those are invalid. A plus, A plus. Both fucking invalid. Um... Seems pretty fucking good. Fuck yeah, dude. God damn, that's good. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. No crashes. Look at that. No bugs. No bugs. I just, I don't get how I'm so fucking good at code, man. Noise. Noise.
What a what a great parser, man. What a legendary parser. Is it fast? Yeah, that's pretty fast. Oh, that's not even release. That's not even my final form. <laughs> Whoa, what? Actually? Actually? Is that what I what I'm seeing? Uh, let me files is vec new. Files push. Buff. Or file and files. If this form of length is used, then end of content shall be present. Yeah. It's okay, we're gonna get rid of that uh, rule anyways in a second. File it, slice. Bam. Let IT is instant now. We don't actually want a strict parser. Uh, use standard, uh, nah. Uh, laps. That's fucking good, man. Can I divide that? Does that allow dividing? Aww. What does that divide it by? Seconds? Huh. I'm pretty fucking happy with that, man. We can parse 2.2 thousand ASN uh, 1 files in 21 milliseconds. So we're doing approximately... Nine microseconds per file. Yeah, buddy. Are sure Rust doesn't optimize it out since you don't use data? Uh, it shouldn't be able to. I can divide by length. Got to do this then. Mm, apparently it has to be a U32. Sick. Yeah. Oh yeah. Seven microseconds per file. That's fucking good, man. So... Uh... E... Negative six. 135,000 a second. So I could do like 13 million on my uh, other server. That's okay. Um. I'm actually surprised how many of those parsed, man. If... Uh, data is none. Prints. Uh, moose. Okay, we've got a few mooses. I can imagine why. Trailing data is going to be one of them. We're going to ignore it. 
Well, we'll start with this for now. Uh, now we're going to do this. Fields. Um, so indefinite length on a primitive is not valid and thus that's a parsing error. Do I agree with that? I mean, yes, I do, but do I super agree with it? No. Um, I mean, it just wouldn't work, so I, I'm okay with that. Uh, this one, return a field. Uh, if there's trailing data... Mm. 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 TLDR, I think that's what's giving me a lot of the moose. I'm going to see how many moose I don't have if I get rid of uh, that constraint. Okay, we still have a few mooses. 205. 432. Okay, so we lose a couple just due to straight parsing errors. All right. All right. I got to do the next part. I got to take a quick bio break. I'll be right back. Okay, so now I got to do the hard part. Uh, how's this code quality looking? Vint's looking okay. Uh, identifiers looking okay. Um, uh, length's looking okay. Mm, this is a um, a header for a record. I don't even think they're called records, but whatever. A header for a record. Uh, which 
has identification and the length. Okay, field. Um, a recursive uh, structure which um, allows for uh, or a nested data structure for all of the fields of an ASN1 uh, format. Okay. Impl field parse option self uh, creates the um, empty uh, stack for handling the uh, recursion level. Some good fucking code. Okay. Oh, are we not gonna have to reformat any code? It's only comments that go over? Oh, we're blessed. We're blessed. Beautiful. That is art right there. Okay. Uh, field mm, self 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 Self. Technically, energy overflows on these. Mm, field. Parse. Bam! Uh, okay. What we gotta do here? Uh, these are fine. That can't overflow or underflow. Um... This one consumed. We're not going to be able to overflow that one either because that's actually a fucking length. Um, ah! Oh, I can just search for plus, can I? Yeah. Uh, that one's good. This one, header plus payload. Uh, header plus payload, which come from level, which come from um, here. Those are real lengths, that's a real length. Um, I think we're actually good on all of those. Okay, it should be pretty resilient. There might be like a bug here or there, but it should be pretty good. Um, obviously, there's no unsafe, so we have no memory corruption. So if you crash, worst case scenario, we maybe get a panic. Um, how long does parse take when you drop caches? What do you mean by that? Whoa. Okay, and it should be deterministic and everything, which is good. Okay. Hello, <laughs> and what the heck am I seeing? You're watching, uh, effectively, you're watching me go through writing an ASN1 parser such that I can fuzz other ASN1 parsers. <laughs> So we're writing the parser to fuzz parsers. Okay. All right. Pub FN serialize. Free all the buffers and you have to reread them from disk? I mean, that's just not a realistic scenario. I'd never actually have these things on disk, so I don't care. 
Uh, as literally all you're doing is benchmarking disk. You're not benchmarking this tool at all. Um, uh, out mute vec u8 uh, serialize a variable length integer. Uh, we wrote this yesterday, didn't we? We're gonna grab that code because uh, yeah. Hmm, where did we write that code? <laughs> Where the fuck? Uh, did we write that on Grizzly? Yeah. Let's grab this. We were happy with this, right? Pretty sure. Uh, s replace all occurrences of white space. That is, uh, delete all trailing white space. There's got to be a better way of doing that, but whatever. Okay, uh, get... In this case, 32, um, let bits is equal to um, eight times core mem size of uh, u size, or yeah. Now we could say vint. Um, Repr. I forget what you do uh, if it's kind of naked. Uh, Rust wrapper. Other wrappers. Transparent. Okay. So, get the number of bits, bits here. Uh, determine the number of 7-bit chunks needed to encode this value. So, bits multiplied by 8, subtract off the number of leading zeros, which are the number of zeros, or number of bits we do not need, uh, plus 6 over 7, handle vari variable bit, ah, with bits, um, shift it by I, output that on the top, okay. I'm happy with that. Um, okay. Uh... Just gonna do four blah, uh, four i and zero two. Uh, vint i i serialize mute buff, uh, buff clear. Asserts. Um, let mute pointer is equal to uh, buff. Assert vint parse pointer unwrap is equal to ii. Sick. Looks good to me. Okay, let's make a mistake. Let's make sure our test works. It does. Okay, yeah. So uh, that's validating it's identical. Um, basically, we're round tripping all of those values, which is great. Fuck yeah. 
Okay. Uh, serialize an identifier. Okay. Uh, hmm. So the variable length integers only has one representation. That's true. Um, I mean, technically, there's zero padding on those. We're going to stick with something pretty literal for now. Uh, but technically, uh, technically, it's not exactly what I want. You can't zero pad. You, you can on the front side. You can just do 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 81. In spec, I don't give a fuck about the spec. I care about what I can do. Um. Tag num. Okay. Ident is equal to um, self dot class shift six or as you eight shift six and then we can do a self dot constructed as you shift five yep and then we can do out.push idents. Okay. Ooh, pretty boys. Okay. Let's round trip some identifiers. Obviously, obviously this is not going to work, but that's the point, is that this should not work. So we'll do identifier uh, class class universal. Um, constructed true number five. Serialize that. Uh, we don't need a loop. Um, identifier parse is equal to ID. Um, oops. And I can't spell. Constructed. Oh, no, I do want that. And then um, ID serialize into the buff. Okay, of course, we're not round tripping. Good. I would hope not. And what we want to do is... Oh, it's actually not too bad. Um, basically... Um... Or if self dot number is greater than or equal to thirty one, then uh, it's one f. Or if it's greater than or equal to one f, then one f. Otherwise, self number as u eight. Okay. So if the number exceeds thirty one. If it's greater than, or, greater than or equal to 31, then we want to encode a 31 here. Um, okay. 
uh, serialize the first byte of the identifier, and then we'll do a v int. Is this min 1f is u8? Yeah, it is. Uh, self number min 1f is u8. The smaller of the two basically never exceeds 1f. Um, and then we'll do if self number. Um, is greater than or equal to 1f, then uh, vint self number uh, serialize into out. Serialize the uh, tag number uh, as a variable length integer if needed. Bam, that's round tripping. Let's try just a random number. Yeah, it's looking good. Let's try some edge cases. Let's try uh, zero. Let's try hex one f. Let's try hex twenty. Uh, and let's try one e. Fuck yeah, easy. Okay, so we can do v int identifiers. Then a length. Okay, so the length we also have to do, which kind of sucks. I'm going to hopefully get this code back. Okay, this is a uh, length. Uh, length, we'll start off with definite for now. Okay, no serialize, of course. Serialize a length. Uh, match self, self definite. Uh, x self indefinite. Uh, this one's easy. Out dot push eighty. Uh, indefinite length is simply o x eighty. Yep. All right. Indefinite form is just hex eighty. Um. Uh, if x is less than or equal to 7f, then uh, out dot push x, uh, short form, uh, no need for variable uh, length, else, okay. Um, and this one we can also repro transparent. Make sure we get the full zoomies going. Oh, we can't transparent that one, of course. Um, 209. Um, I can do it on that. Okay, uh, 211. Push X as U8. If it's equal, then we're good. Um, 373. Assert that is equal to length definite ii. This should fail, of course. Fantastic. Uh, and what we need to do is get the long form um, length uh, in bytes encoded uh, as part of the top, uh, as part of the first byte. Uh, 
Okay, so then what we need to do is determine the number of bytes that we need to represent this value. Um, hmm. Bird landed on my uh, house and I was making noises. Didn't know what it was. Um, Okay, so I need to figure out uh, the number of bits that I need to encode this value. Um, which is basically, it's kind of the same logic as we did for the variable length int, but slightly modified. Um, we actually have to kind of get this right now. Uh, size of U size, eight bit chunks. <laughs> that formatting. Um, determine the number of eight bit chunks. Eight is this plus seven over eight. This one's fine because the value is guaranteed to be hex 80 or above. Um, so we get the number of... Basically, we round up to the nearest 8-bit boundary. So bits minus that. So uh, 80 hex would be um, uh, 64 minus 8 trailing zeros. So 64, basically we need 8. Uh, we need 8 bits to represent that, plus 7 divided by 8, obviously, is going to be 1. So we'd need one more bit. Yeah, one more bit, and we would need it. So that should work. That's going to determine the number of 8-bit chunks that we need. Um... um... Then we're going to do out dot push hex 80 or eights as you eights uh, push the number of eights for the encoding okay zero to eights get the bits Eight. Top push this. Um. X. Hey, and we get that first try. <laughs> Hell yeah, we did. Nice. Well, we basically round tripped everything. I think it's safe to say it works. Obviously, we don't need to do that many tests. As long as we test across that boundary, I'm happy. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Mm hmm. We can keep that. I don't give a shit. Um, okay. Okay. 
Well, if clear, uh, uh, data serialize. Um, hmm. Um, Assert buff is equal to um file. Nice. Let's get this going. Uh, serialize um, a uh, ASN1 file. Okay, this is on self. We're gonna go recursive for now. Um, just We're just gonna go recursive, bang it out, and then we'll make it non-recursive. We just wanna make sure we're round tripping first. Um, if let, uh, or match, uh, self, uh, self fields record, uh, fields for field and fields, um, field dot serialize out self field record. Uh, data, um, record, serialize, out, out, extend from slice, data, 391, not found on record, um, Pull record. Uh, serialize out a record. Uh, self dot ident dot serialize out length. Come on. Whoa! <laughs> uh, way off. Okay, what dumb thing did I do now? Oh, um, this. Oh, it round tripped. Fuck yeah. Of course it did. Of course it did. Everything. Ooh. Um, I 
Lengths are different. I should be able to round trip these. So we just have to figure out what this bug is. It's required that this is able to round trip. It has to be able to load one and then reserialize it binary identical to the input. It's one of the requirements of this tool. Um It's off pretty early. Looks good. 610, 32, and then we have an 82. Yep. This is what I was concerned about. Um, I wasn't strict enough on these. So I was kind of expecting this. I was hoping this would be in the in the corpus and it, it did show up. Um, uh, six one one byte thirty two uh eighty two hex two byte length and then we're emitting a one byte length, aren't we? Yeah. Um, then the person should remember how they were encoded. It does. It does. It's almost as if we designed it like that from the start, except for the uh, primitives, which we're adding right now. So we're getting fucked on a length right now. So let's go to the length quick. Let's get that one working. Hmm. How do I want to store that info? Um, hmm. Um, the U8 indicates the number of bytes used to encode the length. Um, if it is zero, short form is used. If it is uh, one, uh, if it's greater than or equal to one, long form is used with um, uh, U8 bytes. So we're gonna have definite zero. Indefinite doesn't need it. This one has definite length length as U8.
I don't know if end of contents is required that it's a short length or not. Um... If a ridge is zero and this two ninety seven don't care. Oh, we can't do that, can we? We can't uh, ignore that. Hmm. So, like, this is going to be wrong because of that. Same with this. Okay. Um, uh, gets the length of self returning none if it's an indefinite, uh, if let some. If let self definite uh, len comma discard is equal to self len none. Bink. Yeah, we'll just deref it here actually. I like that more. 350. is equal to zero. If, if the number of bytes consumed is equal to the actual length, um, Cool. Okay, end of contents. I don't know if end of contents has to be zero, zero. Like, I actually don't know. Um, so, where in the spec does it say it has to be short form? Because I didn't see that. Uh, there we only care about the length. That's looking good. Now, um, serialize. If the original is zero and that, uh, eight is equal to um uh core compare max eights and a ridge uh-huh oh yeah okay we got past that one it should be two zero octets perfect thank you for that Okay, so basically, if the original use short form and we fit in short form, use short form. And then in this one, use the larger of the two encodings, the original form and the, um, the original form and the form that's required. So basically, if we have the exact same value, then just emit. Uh, but if the value has changed, then we might actually add more bytes. Um, and we actually make it pass now. So if we don't have this, right, 
we fail on one of these early inputs. And if we switch to this, we fail on a different input. And they're all in sequence, uh, which means that we made progress. So there's probably another one, uh, probably variable ints now, that we have to do the same thing on. Um, the uh, U8 indicates the um, number of bytes to represent the uh, variable int. Mm, number of bytes, number of, yeah. Um, this uh, came from the the original uh, deserialization. So get a byte um, for bytes in one. Uh, consume. Uh, this is u size. This is now a bytes. Return none if we can't encode it. And if we can encode it, then we have that. Uh, oh, unreachable. Uh, that's actually not unreachable. None. Um, maybe, yeah, we actually had an infinite loop before. Obviously, we'd have to keep consuming bytes, but, um, good. 34. Uh, serialize this. Let sevens is equal to um, core compare max. I should just do this. I don't know why I'm not using that format. I'm not used to this. Um, sevens dot max self dot one as u size. One fifty three. Um, serialize an identifier. Okay, um, we have to add that to, um, identifier. Hmm. Uh, enum tag. Uh, I guess, can I just vint this? Let's see if that's going to be a problem. Um, vint. Uh, vint tag num zero. No, that's not gonna. Oh, uh, actually, that will write out correctly. That uses one byte. It's kind of interesting. Um. Right, because this will serialize, if we say one, one set of sevens, then that will actually, no, that's not correct. 
Uh, this one I think we have to special case. Um... If it's greater than or equal to one half, then we have to do that. Okay, um, long tag is a v int option. Um, long tag number, uh, which holds the encoding of the original. I don't know. Do I just do that? Do I just vint it? Uh, two seventy nine. We're kind of overloading that, and I I don't know if I like that. Um. dot zero dot min technically I can do the um long vint here like they could do a one f and then do a zero um and I should I I should support that. Fuck. Um uh. Using DWM as my window manager. Tag. Rough representation of a tag number. Struct tag short long. And this is uh a short tag number less than or equal to uh, less than ox1f. Uh, a long tag number. It's an enum. Uh, tag short zero. 149 tag num in this case. So it'll be tag long, tag short, tag num sick. Um, if Let tag short uh, if tag short is equal to self dot number, then x else one f. If let sum or if let tag long x is equal to self number x serialize out. Oh my god. We round tripped every single one. Fuck yeah.
Nice. This will print the number of matches. Those nanoseconds, they're microseconds. So 1800 per successfully. Um, okay. So there is, there's a decent amount of these. If I just do this, we can see how many of these things um, don't parse. Uh, 432 don't parse. And those don't parse uh, because of trailing data. Is 1809 parse, it's, it's 12 microseconds per parse, per file on average. Um... Indefinite length on a primitive is not valid. Yeah, because we literally would have no idea. Um, it's trailing data. Return error. Sum self field record. Uh, only a field could have trailing data. No, fields could as well. Um, uh, Chilling data, return out. Don't need it. Data into. Okay. Seventy-nine. Okay, a bunch of these. La. Four oh nine. Blah. Four twenty. Uh, trailing. Uh, out, out, trailing. Fuck yeah. Uh, we just have to make it work for this now. Fields, trailing. Extend from slice data.
Uh, oops. I think it's three. I'm doing four just to make sure. Cool. Oh, it's two. Uh, oh. Um. Fields pop. That's the last thing. Um. Uh, let's go to this, and then I think I need to match this. I know that it's, uh, we popped it off a last, so we know it matches this. If let sum, if let self fields Um, x, y, blah is, uh, fields. We'll just do, uh, return sum self fields x, y. We'll move those, and then we'll do a data into, uh, else unreachable. Uh, it's implied. We know. We know we can't reach that point. Hey, now we're down to two o five, and we're still round tripping. Basically, we preserve trailing data uh, in the file now, which is fantastic. Uh, get commit am around trip. Uh, get status. Get add source docs cargo star. Get ignore. Get status. Get commit am around tripping. Uh, history, you see, um, yeah, okay, um, trying to do the same with XML, I do have it for XML, actually, I have this same thing for a shit ton of different formats, um, What do we have? Uh, open SSL fuzz. So this should work on even fucked things. So we round trip all of these. All of those. We would, we would panic if we didn't. Um, but those ASN ones, these like aren't even. Um, Okay, those are also similar. Okay, nice. That's pretty fucking sweet. Yeah. I'm pretty happy where this is at. I'm going to go get some sleep. Uh, we can add mutation to this uh, another time. Um, which is what we'll end up doing. Raid? I could pick someone. Uh... Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. 
My my boy KZ Free streaming. There's an Arch Linux conference. RWX Rob is doing some go. Strawberry Strawberry Hacker is doing some multi I see assembly. We're going to Strawberry Hacker. See y'all later. Bye.